Good afternoon, everybody, and good evening for those of us in India, like myself. Um, I'm Paru Sharma. I'm an MSAUD alum from 2015, and I currently live in New Delhi, India. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about the project that I um, submitted for the GSAP Incubator Prize. Uh, it's called City Scanner. And um, just a little bit of background about myself. I am an urban designer with about um, 11 to 12 years of experience. And having worked in the field of urban design and road safety and urban mobility, um, I realized there was um, there was a there was a gap between infrastructure and behavior. So um, in a in complex societies like in the Indian context, we see a, a big divide between um, the infrastructure that exists and then the actually mobility behaviors. And I'm going to go into that into in the next few slides, but uh, trying to dive into the complexities of urban mobility and how navigational systems and information can sort of bridge the gap and empower vulnerable road users, um, uh, including non-motorized transport users. Right. So uh, just to give a bit of the gist of what I'm going to be talking about today, uh, the idea and the intention and sort of the hypothesis is that more people may walk and cycle if they have tailored navigation that suits their mobility needs for pedestrians and cyclists and makes their mobility experience safer and more enjoyable on roads in India. So uh, looking at the context of road safety in India and why this is such a complex topic, uh, just to give you a background, India is unfortunately the road crash fatalities capital of the world, according to the World Health Organization. Um, and that means that um, not only are there a high number of conflicts, the, the number of deaths is uh, tops the, the countries around the world. Um, and, and the majority of those are vulnerable road users that include pedestrians and cyclists. Amongst all the De Indian cities, Delhi, the capital, has the highest number of fatalities amongst um, all other cities. In terms of uh, uh, the number of users and the mobility, um, uh, the gravity of the situation in terms of these road users, road crash fatalities are disproportionately high amongst non-motorized transport users, which includes pedestrians and cyclists. So uh, amongst um, the, uh, the commuter population in India, 140 million people commute to work every day, according to slightly outdated data, but the only legitimate uh, uh, data set that we have, which is the 2011 census of India. And out of those 140 million people, 33% cycle and 10 uh, sorry 33% walk to work and 10% cycle so uh, amongst this uh, population the number of fatalities is extremely high like i mentioned earlier um, and what that means is on a daily basis uh, 62 pedestrians die per day um, and just as of uh, uh, 2016 there was approximately 2500 fatalities uh, of cyclists in one year um, so 48 percent of all road crash deaths are amongst this road uh, road user population uh, so what does that mean? Okay, road crash fatalities is one thing, but what is the general day-to-day -day urban mobility conditions? Uh, as we know, um, and we must have heard, I am sure many of you may have heard already, um, uh, Delhi's, uh, Indian streets are complex and Delhi streets are extremely complex, uh, which means that there's a continuous jostle for road space. And even when the infra infrastructure exists, it's usually a very, very dynamic situation where um, anything could be different at any particular given moment of time. 
So uh, the, 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 the consequence of what this road safety scenario is, is that not only are um, uh, family members, breadwinners um, uh, uh, getting um, yeah, affected, they are, it's also affecting the economic uh, uh, aspect of uh, de urban development and growth, especially econ um, GDP and um, uh, 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 overall economic wealth of the country. So non-motorized transport users are often the least addressed population because uh, typically they belong to the weakest socioeconomic sections of society in India. Um, within the the road trips the the uh, within the uh, daily commuter trips about 35 percent of vehicular trips in indian cities are short trips and most medium and large indian cities have 56 to 72 percent trips which are short trips which are less than five kilometers so what can we do with this information so we, I conducted a survey, uh, two surveys, two rounds. The first survey was a global survey of about 115 people. And the second survey was an India-specific uh, Delhi NCR region uh, focused survey in which there was an entire uh, assessment of beha uh, mobility behavior and habits. So uh, amongst these questions was, uh, uh, was a question about, would people be inclined to walk more if situations and conditions on Indian streets were different? And overwhelmingly, um, over, uh, you know, over 78% people said, yes, they would like to walk more. And if, and, and similarly for cycling, they also had an overwhelming response to, to having the, the ability to cycle more if they could, if situations were different. Similarly, uh, the, the assessment in terms of would people change their route in case there were obstructions in terms of physical obstructions or even human-led incidences on the on the street and uh, would that be a factor for them and 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 if so would they be open to tech that would actually help them and aid them in this approach and again, 77% um, people said uh, they would be interested in using navigation services for either cycling or walking or both. 97% said they would change their cycling route if there was a physical obstruction or disruptive incident or both on their intended route. And 80% said the same for cycling. So uh, the idea is that there is an overarching inclination and 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 desire to walk more amongst a large population of Delhiites. Um, many of them have the choice and the means to take multiple modes of transportation and ultimately end up with taking uh, the motorized vehicle um, and their private vehicle, which could include cars or, or uh, two motorized two-wheelers, scooters, motorcycles, et cetera. Um, however, even with education and inclination knowledge of sustainable practices, there is a huge uh, disconnect between how people are moving and what they would be willing to do if they had the choice. So, um, so the so we looked at one pilot area in in Delhi. Uh, so this is the over overall um, map of Delhi NCR. So Delhi is Delhi NCR, the national capital region, comprises of Delhi and a lot of satellite towns around. Within that, um, there is one region uh, east of Kailash, which was taken for this pilot survey for number for numerous factors, um, uh, because it is a high density uh, mixed use neighborhood um, and district, and it includes multiple scales of uh, of activity, including the neighborhood scale, the the uh, the district scale, 
the nat uh, the city scale and even the national scale because there are certain um markets and uh, office hubs that attract people from around the country let alone the neighborhood and the city so uh, you know looking at the street and and how people are behaving especially when there is times of high uh, congestion and foot traffic uh, we looked at, we, i say we because me and uh, some volunteers came with me um but we we looked at this particular stretch um if i just go back and you can see in purple the government school one and two um, right in the heart. Uh, so this is the stretch in East of Kailash, which was taken. Uh, so on this stretch, uh, there are two large government schools, um, which function as uh, girls' schools, and then they double up as um, uh, boys' schools afterwards. Um, and this was the time around 12.30 when school was out and they uh, started leaving for their home. Um, so I'm just going to play this video so you can get a sense of what it means. Um, so as we can see, there is infrastructure in place. There is a sidewalk. There are, uh, you know, it, it seems pretty pleasant. Um, however, is it enough? Um, does it seem like it's adequate infrastructure and is it catering to the needs of this, um, this massive flow of pedestrians and cyclists and all sorts of road users all at once? Um, so, so as we can see, you know, even when there is infrastructure, um, you know, this is what on the left side, this is what's kind of resulting the cyclist unfortunately is on the footpath and the the kids and the students are on the road um jostling for space with all sorts of road users um and just another just to give you a sense uh of sorry. i don't know if this is playing Okay, well, nice. quite noisy, so I'll just dim that down. So as we can see here, um, similar situation where uh, even when there are footpaths, uh, they are either obstructed or uh, encroached or just not sufficient. Right, and then what happens when there are people with special needs and uh, you know additional requirements for mobility? What happens then? So this is one crossing um, where sort of students are just left uh, to sort of fend for themselves, even though there's one guard that helps them cross the street. Um, there's just uh, it's just pretty much chaos, as you can see here. All right, and this is the school itself, which doubles up as the boys' school. Right. So, uh, what I what we did next was basically um, see how uh, mobility affects um, uh, the the infrastructure and the navigation services might be applicable to somebody who is traveling um, across the city um, and you know visits east of Kailash, this pilot area, on a daily basis. So this is Nagma. Uh, this is Nagma, and she has she is 22. She works as a care uh, caregiver. Um, she lives in a household of six, and uh, lives in Sangam Bihar, which is a sort of urban slum, informal settlement, and then travels about um, 12, 15 kilometers uh, a day, and then a uh, uh, one way, and then back again the next um, on her way back. And so, what she primarily uses is the bus and she walks or takes an auto rickshaw uh, as first last mile connectivity. She has access to a phone and she has mobile internet services. So that is sort of a plus. Um, right, so her activity mapping is such that at the bottom, as you can see, that's her origin, Sangam Bihar, and then she travels uh, by foot 
to the bus stop, the bus, she takes the bus and then commutes about an hour and a half um, overall and reaches east of Kailash where she then takes, uh, uh, she walks the rest of the way. And um, as we can see in these photos, even on the best days, you know, there are things that happen um, like in any city, but in India, there are lots more additional uh, sort of layers of uh, obstruction and sort of inconveniences. So as on the bottom right, when there's a monsoon, um, you know, there's oftentimes there's flooding. On the left side, you can see that there are, even when there are footpaths, that a lot of times scaffolding and uh, construction work uh, takes up blocks those those uh, spaces so people are again forced to move on to the street and then even you know occasionally on a rare occasion a tree might have fallen and then there'll be a detour for hours um, so occasional things like that too um, aside from crossings and sort of just uh, a lack of uh, cohesiveness in terms of of where people are walking so the question is, can mobility as a service and urban information services ameliorate inequities in public urban space, particularly amongst underserved vulnerable populations? Can information be the bridge that makes the experience for these vulnerable road users better, safer, and more secure? So, uh, so coming to what the idea behind City Scanner is, is to take uh, navigation services like we have already and create crowdsourced uh, database of urban hyperlocal information and create a community driven approach of not only um, uh, 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 information and and uh, and and um, pain point uh, mapping, but also smarter navigation services and trip recommendations based on whatever dynamics situations are happening on ground right now. So sort of like a ways and, and a next door combined to, to suit specifically the pedestrian and cyclist. So usually, you know, even when there is a disruption in and whether it's, you know, a protest, unfortunately, or a, uh, a, a you know, a, a rally in, in India, we also have a lot of marriage ceremonies, which are called barats, and those are very, very frequent and think this is the wedding season now, so we should be seeing them now any day. And, uh, you know, we have multiple incidences like that on a daily basis. Um, so how can we create uh, quicker, smarter, efficient routes that are primarily based on the comfort and the uh, uh, satisfaction and convenience of of the end user and the and and these um, expert uh, uh, vulnerable road users. So the idea is to basically take your data, um, uh, upload it, um, be part of a, a crowdsource database, view that accessibility heat map, plan uh, smarter, efficient trips with uh, sustainable active transportation in mind and receive navigation guidance and alerts in real time based on things that are more particularly suited for cyclists and pedestrians. And by no means is this sort of a, uh, a sort of uh, uh, be all end all for, you know, um, intended as a be all end all for uh, uh, travel and uh, commuter experiences. This is supposed to be an additive uh, community-based tool that can provide value over time. So uh, these are some mock-ups. Um, I'm just going to skip through those. And the idea is basically to tie up with um, not only businesses and organizations, but also create value for governments and real estate agencies to create better uh, uh, hyper-local planning, which is based on existing activity and behavior, um, which can ultimately create 
safer public spaces and more valuable interventions in terms of amenities. So um, at the end of the day, I just want to say that, you know, we, we know that there are existing navigation services um, available, right? There's Google Maps, there's Waze, and even a next door gives you sort of um, uh, uh, real-time dynamic information about your, your locality. But the in India specifically, Google Maps and Waze are primarily focused on the motorized vehicle. They completely miss the opportunity of tailoring their services for what specific needs that the pedestrians and cyclists have. So City Scanner is sort of a, uh, 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 a, a hopes to be a bridge between what is existing and what can be and um, adapt with time over what the needs of people are. Uh, so just quickly, I, you know, there's a quick mock-up here, which I'd like to play if there's time, and it's sort of uh, very work in progress, uh, but similar to how um, other navigation apps work, uh, the idea is to basically create um, a system where you can where you can choose the experience you want rather than just rely on the quickest shortest or the um, you know least traffic route um, a lot of parameters for cyclists and pedestrians include things like you know thermal comfort noise pollution um, topography and avoiding dangerous intersections, et cetera. And th those are the kind of um, minuscule nuanced uh, parameters that we focus on at City Scanner. That's it. And that's all. And, and please, if you have any questions, comments, I would love to hear from you. Uh, please reach out at cityscannerapp at gmail.com and www.cityscanner.net. Thank you so much, Parul. Um, I also want to, did you mention how you have, you're also connected now to the Columbia University entrepreneurship ecosystem? I did not. Um, I, yeah, I have a sort of, in, um, I've had a few good relationships with uh, Columbia entrepreneurship. I was part of, uh, it started off with applying to the Columbia Venture Competition um, last year. And was it last year? Yeah, okay. Um, 2021, where I was a finalist for the Urban Works India Challenge. And then um, I, was, uh, I was part of the Start Me Up Bootcamp. Uh, which is a really awesome uh, sort of incubator type, uh, very fast paced, uh, I don't know how to call it, cohort um, led by the Columbia engineering team. And then I was also part of Project 2.8, which is an amazing incubator by Columbia uh, for women founders. And I highly re recommend people apply. Um, great cohort, very supportive team. And we just, uh, we're, we're growing. And I think it's the third year now. Um, so do apply for the fourth year next year. And uh, I'd love to help or, or answer any questions or hear from anybody. Um, that's As great, Perul. I love that you've been able to um, take advantage of all your alumni um, resources, including the incubator prize, but also making that connection between school-based um, alumni communities and also the university level. And speaking of female <laughs> res specific resources, we do have a question from Luciana about um, whether there's research looking at gender issues in the urban space in particular, and maybe specific to India might be a little more um, poignant. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, there's a lot of research now that is coming up about how uh, uh, women move uh, in, in society and, and in cities, different cities kind of have like slight 
variations, of course, because there are cultural shifts. But uh, there's a lot of great work happening by some of my colleagues and peers as well. Um, so the one, there is an, uh, I mean, ITDP is a great organization which is doing a lot of uh, mobility and gender oriented mobility studies in India. Um, and uh, there is uh, uh, multiple consultants. I know that there is an organization called Safe City, which um, is amazing because it is an app but it's also an organization led by, I mean, the organization is Red Dot Foundation, um, but they uh, they basically track, you know, things like um, all, you know, gender related violence and harassment, and it's anonymous, and people can track um, uh, and just sort of, it's location based, so you can track, and it tracks the coordinates, um, but basically they're trying to like um, quantify the the sort of uh, negative experiences on Indian roads, which we all know about, but we've never really kind of quantified that. So I think it's really interesting. And it's also in other countries. So there's something, uh, some in, um, I think Colombia is, it's also in Colombia, I might be mistaken. Um, but yeah, do look them up. Um, and Gender related work is really, uh, I've actually worked on um, a report where we hired consultants at the UN Habitat India, um, where we were working on sustainable cities um, uh, for tier two cities, you know, um, in, improving and then sort of uh, visioning their, envisioning their growth um, in the next five to 10 years. And uh, there was a huge focus on um, gender related, uh, gender oriented sustainable strategies. So that okay. the UN Habitat is also doing work in that space here. Okay, that's that's great. And just sorry, in the interest of time, if anyone else has questions for Perul, please reach out to her. Um, but unfortunately, we we need to um, go on to the next next project. But thank you so much, Perul. That was incredible. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Leslie. Hello, my name is Luciana Varcuza. I'm an architect, a research and educator. And first, I would like to thank Columbia GSEP for the opportunity and a number of people who were essential for this research development. And this is Reforest, searching beyond the material catalog. As material specifiers, we have to acknowledge that our work as architects and designers has a direct impact on forests. Could we develop our sense of awareness and potentially connect our projects to restoration initiatives that are already happening in those extraction sites? We see forests as commodity producers, but they are also places of territorial instability, which leads to food insecurity, connecting people with issues of deforestation, forest degradation and illegal activities in the search for income increase. We will be traveling now to the state of Sao Paulo in Brazil. This research is identifying strategies that help communities grow economically while preserving the forest, associating the knowledge of indigenous peoples and traditional communities in the state of Sao Paulo, connecting with sites where agroforestry and regenerative agriculture systems have been carried out in the sparse regions where remnants of the Atlantic forests in Brazil. The goal is to investigate and document those efforts in order to inspire projects more integrated to the forest and its peoples. The Atlantic forests, Niri, in Guarani's people's language, where the souls bathe, and sorry if I'm mispronouncing it, was the first biome encountered by the colonizers and the first to be exploited due to its richness and its strategic location. It extended along almost the entire Brazilian coast. From its original 129 million hectares of native forest cover, studies estimate that about 12.4% is left in a highly fragmented landscape, with 90% of those remnants being private properties. 149 million people live in this biome, which is 72% of Brazil's population, and it concentrates 70% of the country's GDP. Of the 400 species in the Atlantic forest, 14 that are at high risk are endemic to the biome. The golden lion tamarind, the jaguar, 
the giant anteater, the howler monkey, the Jussara palm, the pau Brasil, the Jequitiba rosa, the peroba. The impacts of deforestation and climate crisis make this biome the protagonist of several restoration initiatives. Looking back at the forest history, it's important to acknowledge that the forest was already managed by its, its original inhabitants. The slash and burn system established by the Amerindians was a less invasive process. Consequently, the damage to, be, to the forest was not irreversible. The process happened every 20 to 40 years, only when the forest had grown back to a certain high and the secondary or successional forests would end up recovering the abandoned fields. In contrast to this logic, the process imposed by the Europeans denied such care, generating ecological damage. A native tree species that would inspire Brazil's name, the Pau Brasil, was one of the first commodities to be exploited by the Portuguese invaders. Thousands of tons were extracted by enslaved indigenous peoples. The Portuguese also introduced cultures with high commodity value, accelerating the process of forest destruction. Forest diversity was replaced by monoculture crops through a cycle that left no time for the forest to recover. During the process, dozens of indigenous villages were destroyed, their inhabitants killed, captured, or eliminated by infectious disease. Warren Dean, in his book With Products and Firebrand, The Destruction of the Brazilian Atlantic Forest, writes that the conservation of natural resources would prove irrelevant in a society in which conservation of the human life was irrelevant. By dividing Brazil into captaincies in 1532, the presence and the rights of indigenous inhabitants were completely ignored. Turning indigenous people into slaves was a deliberate attempt to destroy a culture and create a subordinate caste. A society began to form, defined by land tenure, who lives in the cities and who lives in villages, plus their rights, depending on origin and race. The city was synonymous with civilization. Villagers and the Western idea of nature were considered wild, a concept that had separation and segregation as its foundation. As Jean-Baptiste Debré portrayed here, and call, it's called civilized Guarani. The current biome situation is a result of the direct ecological and social impacts of a series of economic cycles that were established in the region by the invaders and carried out with slave, enslaved work throughout centuries. Brazil's political transitions from colonial to imperial and to Republican government accelerated the forest devastation. In the past 30 years, croplands doubled and monocult tree plantations quadrupled. The predominant crops grown in the Atlantic forest, sugarcane, eucalyptus, soybean, maize, and coffee are commodities produced in highly intensive and mechanized systems that rely mainly on flatter terrain, pushing deforestation to those areas. In 1960s, federal laws established tax incentives for eucalyptus reforestation, the planting of a single species tree, native or exotic, as large monoculture areas for wood, paper, or pulp. The program included cheap loans to the companies with pulp operations becoming widespread in the region. Areas of native forests were replaced by large extensions of homogeneous eucalyptus plantations, which are constantly bombarded with pesticides. The coastal states of Espírito Santo and Bahia are rapidly heading towards their desertification. And here we see in dark brown, uh, the eucalyptus monoculture uh, area increased from 1985 in the top image and 2020 in the lower image, both in the states of uh, Espírito Santo and Bahia. Communities and smaller farmers who live surrounded by those plantations denounced the situation countless times. Popo companies and are pressuring land issues, communities expulsion, and promote serious health impacts. The main companies operating the region are FSC certified. A quote from Eliane Brun, journalist from El País. We have to look at what was the pattern that created what we are experiencing. This thought of Western origin, white, patriarchal, binary, that created this emergence that we are living in. We should look at the people who planted the parts of the forest and their ancestors and learn from them. The direction of current strategies has to come from these groups. The research is currently mapping five case studies in the state of Sao Paulo, where we present two of those case studies, Corupituba Farm 
in Vale do Paraíba and Tecuacalipet in Tenondeporã, indigenous land in the city of Sao Paulo. This map shows both areas location together with the city of Sao Paulo. From 1985 to 2021, we can see the expansion of the urban areas in the region in dark red, agriculture cropland in pink, and silviculture, which is eucalyptus monoculture, in dark brown. In Vale do Paraíba, large cloth farms were divided, resulting in a region punctuated by small properties. With the expansion of the eucalyptus plantations in the 60s, many landowners replaced traditional agriculture and the existing forests in their properties by eucalyptus monoculture. Patrick Assunção inherited the 200 hectares farm from his great grandfather, Cicero da Silva Prado. The farm was once the largest rice paper mill from Latin America. It also had eucalyptus plantations during the 20th century, but the factory was sold to a pulp company after its decline in the 70s. Since 2008, Patrick invested in the monoculture of a native species, the Guanandi, Calophyllum brasiliense, for wood purposes. He then created agroforest systems areas to have other sources of income within this 20 year wait for the Guanandi forest to grow. Before implementing the agroforest systems in the farm, due to the previous monoculture's impact, the degraded soil had to be recovered, which happened with the use of specific plants for that purpose. The practice of green manuring does not harm or contaminate the environment as conventional agriculture. Currently, Patrick grows rice, cambuci, palm hearts, cherries, turmeric, bananas, and intended to sell wood in the future. He believes the hardwood silviculture, which is tree monoculture applied to agroforestry, will lessen the timber pressure in the Amazon rainforest. His farm supplies main restaurants in Sao Paulo, and he sees the need to open a market for the production. Agroforest products can be a way to generate income to producers cultivating food of high nutritional value, he adds. The research is also mapping initiatives where forest restoration can deliver economic benefits, not only at a large scale, but for local communities. The forest finds support for its recovery in these communities who develop their way of living in parallel with environmental conservation. They preserve, restore, and protect the biome against predatory exploitation. One of these peoples are the Guarani India, who have inhabited the Atlantic forest for thousands of years, the Guarani collective way of living implies the relationship and management of the forest in balance with nature. In the first decades of the 20th century, Sao Paulo state imposed limit spaces and fixed borders on them. The restriction of areas for planting traditional crops contributed to a greater dependence on processed food, threatening Guarani's food autonomy and the continuity of their traditions and affecting their mental and physical health. Suicide numbers and child mortality are increasing among indigenous groups. Maintaining a minimum quality of life is directly related to land demarcation. In 2012, the National Indigenous Peoples Foundation, FUNAI, recognized what is now Tenondeporã indigenous land with approximately 16,000 hectares, which was officially demarcated by the federal government in 2016. Today, there are 14 villages and 1,500 Guarani indigenous people living in the territory. The Tecoa Calipet is one of these villages and it has its name coming from the Guarani word for eucalyptus plantation. The region still has a large presence of the tree. With the Guarani leadership and government supported programs partners, the soil recovery process started. Eucalyptus trees were removed and used to build houses and structures. The community learned contemporary agroecology and permaculture techniques as they considered that those practices dialogue with their traditional knowledge. Guarani people have a remarkable practice of environmental conservation and biodiverse restoration. They see forests as a living and complex organism inhabited by beings and spirits, what the Western society understand as nature. Plants were introduced to recover the soil, making room for cultivation gardens. Some of the species are the crotalaria, the fornage turnip, and the jack bean. This last one is great for recovering the soil's nitrogen levels. At Tecoa Calipet, there are 17 cultivated gardens. There are nine types of corn, 15 types of sweet potato, four types of peanuts, in addition to cassava, pineapple, and pumpkin. 
There are perennial species and other fruit trees, such as Jussara, Araçá, Jaracatiá, Cambuci, and Pitanga, plus wood and medicinal plants. These cultures are called true food. With the youth and elders' participation, four out of 10 farmers are women. Gerapo Chimirim is the leader researching species and exchanging seeds with other communities. Tecuacalipet is creating a larger impact in the region. The Guarani do not plan to sell their products, but for their own subsistence and to strengthen their own culture. Generosity is the foundation of coll collective life. We don't have to live with more than we need. So for us, selling breaks this rule, says Gerard. For them, the most important thing is to guarantee the strengthening of the indigenous land. Gerard adds that they need the physical demarcation of their territory and the removal of no indigenous people who are still in their land. Important to mention that recent increase of the violence against indigenous groups due to state absence and the dismantling of the agencies that are responsible for monitoring the region in this current government. Forests are designed projects with a variety of patterns, patterns that reflect social and economical cycles and have an ecological impact. From the forest original formation, passing through deforestation, agricultural patterns, soil degradation and restoration, the research inquires with pot which potential patterns that combine strategies to aid the communities economically while restoring and preserving the forest may be implemented. It also identifies that food sovereignty and the conservation of cultural rituals and practice are directly rela related to connect to connected to land access. A few points raised so far. Restoration initiatives must involve indigenous populations and other forest peoples, Caissaras, Ribeirinhos, and Quilombolas, local, traditional, and rural communities. Community leadership must be the initiative's managers. Land security is key. In places where they have land security, communities have a vested inter interest in managing the resources on those lands. And a question to designers. Could we enhance our knowledge on how our work impact forests and its peoples? How could that drive a more holistic approach to the work that we do? Thank you. Well, let me take a moment in between presentations to also acknowledge some of our guests here, including Laura Kurgan, a professor of architecture, and now the program director for um, computational design practices. She was instrumental in helping um, create this cohort this year as one of the faculty jurors, along with Lance Freeman, who was professor of urban planning. I also want to um, acknowledge our alumni jurors, uh, including Roberta Washington, former commissioner of the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission and past president of the National Organization of Minority Architects, NOMA, she has her own practice. Um, and then Michael Chen, co-founder of Design Advocates and principal of his own practice, as well as Jason Pugh, the pr a principal at Gensler and member of the company of the firm's Global Race and Diversity Committee, and most recent past president of NOMA. So let's give a round of applause to, to them. Thank you so much. <laughs> Excited to hear from Mustafa Farouki, who is based in Buffalo. And he's going to be the, the first to introduce his, uh, the local interventions. I'm very excited because it's based on um, what GSAP is. It parallels the intro to architecture and urban planning um, summer programs, building out a pipeline um, to, to the profession. So um, Mustafa is doing that with his community in Buffalo through reimagined architecture. So welcome Mustafa, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Leslie, can you hear me? Yes. 
Awesome. Great. Thank you. And I appreciate you making this opportunity available online as well. I wish I could be with you in person today. I'm actually in New York right now. I'm downtown um, in uh, Syracuse University Fisher Center. And because of that, I think it's important just for me to, to sort of begin by saying that I'm, you know, speaking to you from uh, what is traditionally Lene Lenape land. Um, and I think it's important to just sort of call out the dispossession of, of these people, which continues to this day. I also want to acknowledge Knowledge, the Seneca village uh, that was leveled in Central Park, uh, that was an African American uh, settlement there um, to make way for this park that we sort of uh, think just was a sort of part of nature and, and no humans were involved in the raising of that. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I want to also just thank, thank the GSAP incubator uh, for this opportunity, which has been really uh, life altering for me in a way, just in terms of my awareness of things. Uh, and I'm sort of, it's made, it's been very humbling as well. So I really, really thank uh, GSAP Incubator for this opportunity. And I'll try to uh, not go too long. A lot of this, Leslie, you've seen already. So apologies, you, you kind of know the, the script. So the project that I proposed and I'm working on right now is called Reimagine Architecture. And the way I want to set this up, and Leslie had a great introduction, but the way I want to set this up is to just sort of talk to you about the trajectory over the past 12 months about what I've been working on and where we're at right now. So, oopsie, there. So Reimagine Architecture is a new free program for BIPOC high school students who might be interested in applying to architecture school. Participating BIPOC high schoolers will join a network of design students and professionals, network, who can offer insights and advice on how to get into architecture school. High school students will attend four meetings in person or Zoom that will cover questions about who goes to architecture school and how you actually apply. And we will help these students create a portfolio that they could use for applying to architecture school one day in the near or distant future. Okay. Students who attend all four meetings and complete a decent portfolio will receive a $175 scholarship to spend on college applications, candy, or anything that they want. Um, and so now we're at fall 2022. I'm just going to take you back on a timeline through what I've been working on or some notes. So got started in November 2021 after sort of uh, receiving the, the grant uh, from GSAP Inc., and the first sort of thing that I wanted to do in Buffalo, where I'm based, is to have an outreach with a school that would sort of be an appropriate um, candidate for this program. And so I narrowed in on the Buffalo, uh, the what we call Buff Arts, uh, which is the Buffalo Academy for Visual and Performing Arts. So you could say that it's similar to, for those of you from New York, if you're familiar with LaGuardia High School in the city, it's that type of school. It's a public school, uh, but it, they do have a focus on arts programs. It's also a school in which I think 81% of the students would identify as BIPOC students. Um, and so it made it a sort of a really great, um, and it's also in the east side of Buffalo, which is a majority black community. Uh, uh, just so you know, the uh, Buffalo, the, de the demographics there is a 49% uh, Black or non-white Hispanic. Um, okay, so this was the school I identified. I immediately started doing some outreach with this school. Uh, this is a really cool mural that's on the outside of it. I started doing some visits there um, and very sort of funny, odd experiences that I had when I went to go visit there. One, I kind of was just thrown into the middle of the cafeteria during lunch and handed a microphone. And, and it was like, oh, here comes Mustafa and he's gonna talk about this amazing program. And here I am with 300 students, all, all like eating, like throwing food, whatever. And I'm telling him about this really, really great program where you can earn a scholarship to learn about architecture, potentially apply. And an interesting thing happened, which was that the principal, uh, Principal Judy Covington, and many of the teachers as well, they're black and white, uh, but they sort of came to me, the principal came to me and said, you know, um, what is it? And I said to her, oh, well, you know, it's a program to help students get into architecture school to kind of teach them about architecture. And she's like, yeah, 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 but, but what is it? And I was like, um, well, you know, it's it's a program. Like, and I and I kept on explaining the program. And what she actually, the principal was actually asking me is, what is architecture school? Like, I don't know what that is. What do architects actually do? And this was really sort of um, a moment for me where I had to stop and ask myself some questions. 
take off that annoying gif, I had to ask myself some questions about this, which was how am I approaching this and what assumptions am I actually making? Realizing that I'm trying to address the BIPOC community, particularly a black community. And so many people in that community have their access to architecture, to the profession is so distant that they actually don't know what we do. Um, and so that made me actually have to go back to the drawing board a little bit, rather than being like, oh, I have this great program and I wanna share it with all of you. I think I, I had to sort of figure out how do I teach people what this program actually is trying to do and why is it even valuable? So I was teaching a course at this time at the University of Buffalo, it's a ARC 404 lab. And what I did was basically, I tried to get my students, there was 10 students, uh, all undergraduates at University of Buffalo, all different races. And I tried to get them to create a game that would teach high school students what architecture actually is and why it's sort of interesting, right? Why should they pursue it in the first place? Because it's these limits to access and, and, and sort of limits to accessibility that I think really, really need to be addressed. So some of the students, they all came up with these different ideas. One of them named Tommy Lidlow came up with this, the idea of the Durand game, which could be sort of a Tetris type thing that you know kids could play it and they would get really, really interested in architecture. Um, and then this was a board that he made for that. Uh, another student uh, made this thing called Architrack, which was basically you kind of go travel all around the world and look at different sort of specimens of architecture. And he thought that that could be a really, really cool way to get a high school kid interested in design. Um, and it was a sort of a storytelling mode of a game. Um, and these are some of his slides, actually, uh, and how he kind of dealt with it. So there would be little pieces, and there'd be little um, a, a board, and you would move around on it. Um, and then there was another one by Noah called Architecture Seen It. His take was that like students, everybody likes films. And so if we can get students interested in architecture through movies, that could be a really, really cool way to sort of create outreach. Um, and then also there was a student who um, was from Buffalo and she's like, oh, maybe we can create a game that's like a scavenger hunt. And so students would go to some of these buildings, Buffalo's, you know, great architectural culture. and. Frederick Law Olmsted City. Uh, and so maybe that would sort of get students to get interested. So we have people thinking about history, people thinking about film. This is sort of how I began to address this question of what is it, right? The, the issue was like thinking about how to get this uh, sort of field, uh, make it accessible to people or make it sort of get people to sort of answer some questions about it. Um, and so there was a bit of a wee reboot uh, after uh, some of those experiments. And I started to do more targeted outreach at the school, um, which was basically less of me sort of walking around with flyers in the cafeteria and me actually meeting with um, teachers in the you know, arts department who would know actual students who could be really, really interested in this. So I could talk to them about architecture, perhaps using some of these games from the seminar. Uh, so that was in January, February, and March. Uh, I got a bunch of students to sign up. Big problem, and I think I have to talk to some of you about this, is these kids, high schoolers, do not check email. Uh, They're communicating with each other, and this is, was mind-blowing, and I'm like, you guys are all going to get fired for not checking your email one day in an architecture firm, <laughs> but uh, I didn't actually say that, but yes, it's it, getting reaching out to the students and finding a way to reach them that wasn't creepy Instagram messages, uh, which was also suggested to me too, was uh, was an issue, right? The kids, they're, they're, not using, um, they're not using email. So I had to sort of think about using Discord, using GoTo, things, all of these apps that these students are using to get, um, they instantly don't use WhatsApp either, which I discovered, and that was a huge failure in, in terms of my outreach because um, a lot of the students, uh, it's mainly for international students, people, things like that. So outreach was an issue. Contact was an issue. I also got some feedback from them about would they like a program on a weekend or a weeknight. Um, I'm just going to move this here. Uh, so people actually preferred weekends over weeknights for a program. So that was interesting to learn. Uh, it's doing right. In person versus virtual, to be honest, there was, a, I think, in terms of these students who I had polled, some of them were like actually totally fine with in person and they, they really, really liked that idea. Others really, really preferred virtual. I mean, depending on where they were coming from. This is a school where students are not necessarily from that neighborhood. They could be coming from all over. So the virtual option was something that I thought, okay, I'm gonna integrate a virtual option into the program. Uh, portfolio seemed to be more of an interest as opposed to creating a new art or architecture project. 
uh, the students that I talked to said that they would rather work on something that was related to college applications than creating some brand new architecture project, um, which may or may not be useful to them for their college careers, right? They're thinking about college and they're thinking about time and budgeting that time. So that was sort of uh, important for me to learn. And also the idea of whether or not it should be in the summertime, a lot of the students in, uh, were sort of okay with the idea of maybe a summer uh, sort of college or high school enrichment program. A lot of students though, particularly in this school, they go visit grandma or grandpa in North Carolina or in, or, uh, in Georgia over the summertime. So summer wouldn't be good uh, for, for a lot of the students. So this, these were things also were making me think about the virtual element and how I would reboot this. Um, what happened actually in May that you all know about were two tragedies. Uh, one was the, uh, the white supremacist lynching at Topps Market on Jefferson Avenue, uh, resulting in the death of 10, 10 people, all black people who were killed there. And then that was followed very quickly, as you remember, by a school shooting in Uvalde in which I think 23 students were murdered. These two things uh, actually really um, shook up the, the program for me and what I was trying to do. Uh, and maybe for reasons that might be obvious and maybe not, here is the location of my school of Buff Arts. There's the tops. This is the grocery store for this neighborhood for students going to the school who are living in this area. So there was a direct, uh, you know, there was the school was reeling from this shooting. Um, there were people whose family members were involved or were injured or were murdered at that store. So that really shook things up. It shook up the community and put me on sort of a weird off footing in terms of how I should proceed with this program and be respectful and sensitive, right? Not walking into the school five days after the shooting with my flyers. How do I actually treat this with a little bit of respect? Um, the other issue I think, particularly after Uvalde was that access to schools uh, became a big, big problem. And it's at the point now where in Buffalo, because of these two competing tragedies, uh, you can't really enter a school unless you're a family member um, of a of, of student there. And I think even they, it's only one family member who's allowed and there's a bunch of signatures and paperwork that has to be done. Uh, the schools also around Buffalo after these two tragedies have become highly guarded. There's a, a, a huge police presence around the school that I think makes students uncomfortable that actually started to make me a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, and so these were things that definitely affected the, the program and how I wanted to proceed. And so I did some further reboots. What I did actually is I started to reach out to my own students, both at University of Buffalo School of Architecture and also at Cornell AAP, where I was teaching last semester. And I reached out to my black and brown students. So these are all black students actually, and asked them to sort of become sort of outreach for me. Uh, in terms of they could get friends, they could get people who are interested, they could maybe start um, asking questions about what architecture is and getting people to sort of want to participate by their own example. And so here are some of the students. And the idea, the way that it's working right now is that we have these sort of initial core group of students who are all being compensated for their time. And they then are reaching out to their friends, their cousins, things like that, telling them, you know, this is an interesting program. You may be interested in architecture. Here is what it is. Um, and then the idea is that they then may tell other people, and this could be sort of a, a way of uh, kind of thinking about community, right? So we're still based in Buffalo. We're still trying to attract students in Buffalo. We're getting attraction from students there, but we're reaching out to them in different ways, maybe less through the channel of the school. Uh, which that avenue is a little bit more difficult now and more through just word of mouth community networks through students who I trust and who trust each other. And so this is kind of the idea of the community that we're building right now. Uh, so in August 2022, we started with some onboarding uh, where we're actually by word of mouth got students interested in this program, interested in these four sessions, um, and it's their choice whether they want to do uh, virtual or not. Uh, and that that's kind of uh, in the process right now. Uh, what happens is in the first meeting, we sort of show you what architecture is, maybe through a game, what architecture school is through personal experience, right? Uh, and then in the next bit or the next meeting, those students then talk to us about what their interests are and we listen and we try to figure out, is this like maybe something that you would want to do? Uh, and that's kind of a phase that we're in right now. 
And then lastly, portfolio practice. Thinking in particular about two schools, UB Arc Plan and Cornell AAP, thinking about what those schools require and building a portfolio or getting the students to build a portfolio based on these requirements of a school. Um, and so that's a, another thing we were thinking of. Um, as of July, we had eight architecture mentors that I shared with you, uh, 10 core students at BAFPA, and 15 associated students that are all throughout New York State. I'm limiting the program to New York State right now with the idea that University at Buffalo, um, which is a SUNY school, could potentially be a trajectory for some of these students who are in state. And happening tomorrow actually is a, a big drive that we're kind of co-sponsoring. Uh, Tops, uh, where this uh, lynching happened, has now reopened and it's very problematic what's happening there. Um, the shop is basically just, they fix some doors and windows and act as if nothing even happened. The community members are saying, we are terrified of going into that shop. We don't want to go there. We want other options. And so tomorrow we're participating in an event with our eight core students and some of the high school students from BAFPA to attend this meeting, to think about how we can reimagine Jefferson Avenue and the tops there. And think of something otherwise uh, than just uh, a, a, a reopened grocery store with a new pharmacy that really was not serving the community too well, uh, even before the, the lynching there. Um, so that's kind of where we're at right now. Uh, I'm going to just, and I hope I haven't taken too much time, but I wanted to thank you for this opportunity. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm so grateful for it. And I continue to learn for it. So uh, learn from it. So thank you. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I just had a terrible nightmare vision there, Leslie, that I was muted the entire time and I was really, really nervous. But <laughs> it wasn't, I would have been horrible. No, I know we heard people. everything. That was okay, so fascinating. Good. And, um, okay, good. and also for me to just think of high school students in a, a particular age group as its own kind of community and um, hearing your process of how to engage with them um, using the age demographic. That was really interesting. Um, so I, I, we have time for one or two questions. Yeah. I'd love to take any questions. I, I'm really curious to hear what people have to say or contributions or, or suggestions. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Um, my name is David and this summer I was teaching a high school architecture course um, through City Tech called College Now. And um, it's really fascinating to hear kind of your story about how to engage with high schoolers, how they totally are like their own community. And it's in a lot of ways, it's hard to bridge that gap, especially coming from such a strong like academic setting. Um, and so I guess my question is like, when you were beginning this um, program, were you always committed to kind of being your own entity and not affiliating yourself with a certain school? like? Um, and in doing so, what kind of challenges or like affordances have you come across? Okay, thank you so much for that question, Jeff. Uh, and it's such an important question. Yeah, um, I always had the plan to partner with a school. I just didn't think that the partnership would be so fraught with so many failures. Um, and there's reasons for that. One thing is that you know, you, you parachute in with your Ivy League degree and, and you're sort of your, your savior complex and people are suspicious uh, now more than ever, but people in these communities are like a little bit like, what, who, what are you trying to do? And, and, and rightfully so. So I think that Jeff, that was a, an initial hurdle for me working with these schools was people who just were sort of like teachers who well-meaning good intentions, but teachers have sort of an obligation to protect their students from some stranger walking in off the street, right? And I didn't go to that school and my family didn't go to that school or, or, and I'm not from that community. So I think that that be, kind of became an issue and I had to really go to the school multiple times to build trust. Um, so that was sort of a, a, a really important thing for me. Um, there's another issue as well, which is that you can't, and I should have, figure this out. They're not going to leave high school students alone with some random 40 year old man. There has to be educator there, right? And so that means 
is that teacher now, they're just going to be forced basically by the principal to be with me at this program. That teacher is not getting compensated for that. So I could either compensate that teacher using the incub incubator. We, we believe in equity, right? And people should be compensated for their time. But this was an issue. I think a lot of there was a little bit pushback because, you know, somebody at three o'clock wants to go home to their own family, not spend three to four helping Mustafa with his after school program. Right. So this was sort of uh, an issue for me as well. Um, but I'm committed to working with a school. I don't want to sort of be just my own entity. I need the school uh, to give me the students. And there were, Jeff, some frustrating moments where I was like, oh, God, I got this money here. Somebody take it. <laughs> like it was almost like a, a kind of a, I wanted to give it away. And there was no, there were no takers. Uh, and which is why I had to sort of reorganize a little bit and think about other networks beyond me just landing into that school. So I hope I've answered those two questions, Jeff, but thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, and it's David, but thank you. Oh, thank sorry, you. <laughs> I don't know where I'm <laughs> Jeff from. I'm no. Sorry about that. I really, I really appreciate the work that you're doing. I think it's great. Thank you, David. And Mustafa, there's one question um, from Parul in the chat. If um, we about can Urban. sort of touch on it very quickly before we have to move on to um, the next project. Absolutely, Parole, I see your question about the urban design. Um, and I guess what you're asking is, so one, it's not my area, I think. And so that's something that I've uh, kind of been a little bit distant from, but I do think that it's super important. And now with this event tomorrow, reimagining uh, Jefferson Avenue, that's an, a coincidence that we're both using the term reimagine in our titles. Um, I hope that there's some sympathetic action there. But uh, so tomorrow, I think at that meeting, we're going to be talking very, very much about urban design, but it's not something that I have addressed. I think it's something that I do need to address more. But thank you for that question. Okay, thank you. Um, Thanks. Another round of applause. Most, Mustafa, um, I just, I just wanted to say really quick. I am so fascinated by what you just presented. Thank you so much for doing this research. I mean, it's just really, I mean, as a person of color, I was intrigued to hear that you know these uh, Buffalo students did not know what architecture is. I mean, wow. You know, and and you know, to for you to be able to break it down and to explain to them, um, you know what it is. You know that that I found really fascinating. So thank you so much for doing this. Thank you so much, Esther. I'm sorry for for going over. Thank you for your comment. I mean, yes, it's two percent of registered architects are black. Right, meaning that 2%, right, which 15% of the population is now being forced to live in, in a built environment that's not designed by them. Um, it's, it's, we have to answer for that. But thank you so much for your question, Esther, and your support. Absolutely. Thank you. And I think that's actually a great segue to the next presenters, Nelson and Luis, who will also be talking about um, how to create more equity and representation in the built environment through development efforts, actually. So welcome. To my Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for um, making time to uh, come and join us this presentation. Uh, and thank you for everyone in Zoom that joined us uh, for today's presentation. Um, so my name is Nelson Jesus and this is Luis Miguel. And we are very excited to introduce, um, to give you some background on the, on the and perspective on the work that we've been doing uh, that has emerged from uh, our work as alumni from GSAP and to explain the issues um, that we hope to address uh, in the surrounding communities in Harlem and the Bronx, uh, as well as present uh, and explain the different uh, phases of the work um, that we have been doing and will continue to be doing in the next months. Um, so firstly, we, we want to tell you a little bit about us um, and our mission. Um, we are Luis Miguel, as, as Nelson put it, Luis Miguel Pisano, Nelson de Jesus Ubri, both members of the class of 2021 in the architecture and real estate development programs. Um, our critical outlook towards housing uh, and economic development has been framed by our individual narratives. As um, BIPOC first-generation designers ourselves, we have developed an understanding of equity and community that is colored by our own transitions uh, across cultural and geographic 
territories. Um, growing up in, in Mexico, for me, I was very influenced by my experience with Spanish style architecture, um, residential design and uh, state housing agencies uh, that addressed uh, low income uh, housing needs like Infonavit. Um, equally influential were my teenage glimpses of the housing crisis in suburban Houston. Um, as a design professional, I have worked um, on often contrasting uh, lines of work, um, such as high-end homes in capital-rich communities of the Northeast, as well as uh, tenant-in-place rehabilitations of 60-plus NYCHA buildings, what we commonly understand as the projects, uh, and 2,600-plus units. This is a project um, that is currently underway. And, and for me, uh, having moved from the Dominican Republic uh, and growing up in the Bronx and Inwood, uh, observing new tenement um, style buildings, as well as uh, Tower in the Park, multifamily has inform informed my understanding um, of dense cohabitation uh, and urban living around shared community spaces, uh, amenities and infrastructure. Uh, professionally, I have worked uh, in New York based uh, residential, uh, commercial and retail. Um, and that relationship has share my, um, what I'm more focused on, which is more economic development around New York City uh, through the EDC. So really understanding how um, the outer communities, not just Manhattan, which has been traditionally the hub where investment has been coming through, how can those outer uh, boroughs see more of that um, investment and also uh, increase in activity, economic activity. Um, although we both came to GSAP with the purpose of training in architecture, uh, we soon found ourselves captured by the uh, analytical impetus of the real estate curriculum. Uh, I know there's some uh, real estate professors in the room, so they, they will um, uh, kind of vouch for this. Uh, and become, uh, we became increasingly interested in our flexibility, in, in flexing our competency across real estate development and architecture so as to improve the conditions in multifamily and affordable housing development. Um, our work across these programs served as a, an interdisciplinary laboratory of sorts, which allowed us to work on projects that investigated conditions for underserved communities in New York City. And as part of this laboratory, uh, we developed a project that study uh, the codependencies between housing, real estate, uh, and urbanism, um, relating, uh, really in the dynamic networks uh, that connect uh, each of the some segments of the built environment. Um, we um, also worked on projects serving um, serving the needs of marginalized workers um, in uh, by reclaiming underutilized lot fragments in Sunset Park. Last year, as we started to think about the work that we wanted to do following graduation, we needed to look no further than the neighborhoods around us, which were experiencing complete upheaval. The COVID-19 pandemic was a radical transformation for many BIPOC individuals living in underserved communities around us. In addition to the disproportionate loss of life of Black and Latino frontline workers, um, the ensuing health and financial pressures uh, made them four times as likely, by one count, to be evicted from their homes. Many households have become extremely, extremely vulnerable to eviction. And according to the New York, uh, New York University for Long Center, uh, one in four households in East Harlem and uh, Central Harlem uh, are severe rent burden, um, meaning that 50% or more of their income, household income is dedicated to rent, uh, pay, paying the rent. Uh, so the issue of rent burden is particularly egregious uh, in the Bronx um, and the city largest rental market. Um, where 80% of household are renters and this, uh, this uh, problem of from Burton is quite um, exacerbated. Um, and so here, uh, so here we wanted to also point out that eight in 10 um, zip codes um, that are also primarily located in Harlem and the Bronx um, have the highest eviction rates um, in a located. So these are the numbers that we focus on. Uh, and so this is something that we wanted to show as part of what this area became the focus of our research. Um, and based on this information that we've started to learn more about in, uh, as in, the, in the wake of the COVID-19 uh, COVID pandemic, um, my then partner, Sarah Zambler, and I developed a project uh, called Stay in Power, uh, which is a body of research and sort of proposals aimed at fostering a network of support, um, both prevent evictions and empower tenants who are in the process of being evicted. Uh, so the project as seen here, um, analyze systems of eviction uh, before and during the pandemic, uh, which were quite exacerbated by the pandemic uh, and the fact that people needed uh, a place to live 
uh, given what, uh, all the, 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 the secrecies around the pandemic. Yeah, and the heightened vulnerability of a growing number of households relative to the impending housing crisis, this is something we, we all dread, but we know it's coming, highlights the importance of community participation and engagement in the development process. Uh, in turn, greater community participation warrants greater capacity building uh, among tenant associations, small community organizations, and startup non-for-profit development um, companies or startups. However, uh, community part participation is hindered by limited public asset access into conventional real estate knowledge and know-how. We firmly believe that the democratization of industry-specific development knowledge will lead to greater access into channels for generational wealth building. Um, at this juncture, it is uh, very important for us to acknowledge that uh, one of our initial foci really centered on the analysis of alternative homeownership models. Um, however, extensive modeling exercises and newfound professional experience in private and public space, uh, in pu uh, public uh, practice, excuse me, have revealed uh, to us just how hard it is to make homeownership uh, viable for folks in an extremely low income bracket in New York City. Uh, agency subsidy levels and institutional mortgage models largely pencil out to serve higher income brackets. Uh, it's just the bottom line, hovering around 130% AMI, that's uh, 173,000 for a household of four, um, in the lowest uh, of cases. Uh, we're still interested in pursuing this study, but we'll need to kind of reframe it uh, in, in the long uh, term. And so, yeah, so, and therefore, the focus of our work has been um, the creation of a pre development toolkit uh, that can be deployed um, with small nonprofit, um, small nonprofit uh, players that can build competency and prepare for uh, prepare them for to interface um, with agencies, stakeholders, um, as well as for profit developers uh, that have uh, that are impeding and uh, and tentative development ideas. Um, and so as we deepen our understanding of the existing uh, structures that enable development in New York City, uh, we, have been, uh, we have broken down such process into five distinct uh, phases um, uh, to discover possible ways to empower uh, smaller, smaller developers, nonprofit developers that want to partake in, um, want to partake in this process to enable uh, more community-centered development, uh, be that be housing or, um, or community facilities. Uh, so as outlined in this, out, as outlined in this diagram, um, these five phases include organization, community organization, public, um, uh, public engagement, particularly elected officials like council members, uh, open procurement, which is the way in which New York City uh, disposes of public land for public center uh, uses. Uh, then there's also the project development, which is where uh, we're also trying to come in, in and then there's the use of the landing. What is the, the use of that long term on the now land lease, which is the way in which the city disposes of land for uses. Uh, so here we have three, we have highlighted three of the buckets that we think our skill set um, can be best implemented, which is that community engagement, kind of looking back at our roots and having lived in, in this community for long, as well as the open procurement, which is where you develop the proposal for a use of the public land and also the actual development of the proposal um, that happens um, pre-development pre and pre-closing. So in the past six months, we've become intimately familiar, uh, this is through our professional practice, with the major players in New York's non-for-profit housing space. Um, we've worked with some of these agencies actively, um, and many times we'll see in, 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 uh, in, in our engagement that it's limited due to uh, availability and capacity constraints at the tenant level. Um, as part of the first phase of our work, we have begun to reach out to several of these players, including Nos Quedamos and Hester Street, to partner in identifying smaller players uh, taking their first steps into the development process. Although it is challenging to identify all forms of engagement at the tenant level, we believe these three categories ably represent the groups that have been able to, um, that we have been able to interact with at community meetings, which are tenant associations, which are usually fewer than a dozen active tenant representatives who gather to advocate on behalf of uh, a broader body, um, as well as uh, non-for-profit development startups, usually small team of principals supported by limited staff with limited experience, 
um, as well as mission-oriented community orgs. So these tend to be groups of uh, widely ranging sizes oriented around a specific mission, often based in a certain uh, geographic uh, domain. So yeah, and so the limited staff and resources of these small parties stand to, in sharp contrast with the enormous uh, scale um, of many affordable housing deals that happen around the city. Uh, as part of this redevelopment, uh, redevelopment of public housing and buildings in New York City, capital in the hundreds of millions uh, is being invested uh, into re the renovation of existing housing stocks. Um, so giving only a portion of the 355 NYSHA development in the city have been renovated, there's still a lot of room for these lower nonprofit community organizations to come in and also do some of this work. Yeah, so in, in the next few slides, we, we will dig a little deeper into the competency building pre-development toolkit that we have begun to build out. The first chapter identifies 13 major design development topics, while the second identifies 10 major development finance topics. Um, while not total in the representation of the development process, uh, we have sought to render a comprehensive cross-section uh, that provides material for manageable building blocks. Um, I think I can just move that. Yeah. So we'll see um, that certain questions that come up with when a small nonprofit is trying to engage um, could be at the level of, of what is happening with underutilized spaces in your development. Um, is it that programming needs to be community oriented, meaning recreation, meal distribution, uh, you know, containing civic and, and legal services, or is it that, um, you know, the, the tenant association really needs retail dollars, uh, and, and that means potentially a space that is occupied by a fresh food provider, a restaurant, or a small business. Uh, similarly, with, with kind of care providers, uh, this is more or oriented around retail, so you'll see mental health daycare, elderly care, and urgent care uh, providers. And, and these are you know, uh, smaller scale endeavors or, or businesses that are still bringing dollars uh, into the tenant association um, activities participation fund. This is something we can uh, get into. It's a discretionary type of fund. Um, you'll see here that we started to paint a picture as to what this means on a, square, on a per square foot basis. In retail in this in this part of, of Manhattan and in, in Harlem and the Bronx, you'll you'll see that uh, a, a retail partner uh, will bring in fifteen dollars per square foot versus a community provider may bring in five dollars per square foot or none at all, depending on the service being provided. Uh, another topic we want to focus on is property management. So breaking down to these tenants, um, you know what what is needed in order to maintain your development. Uh, is it repairs? Uh, which involves typically work order systems, uh, vendor liability, insurance and documentation, as well as HPD inspection, because often when agencies come in and come in and inspect and identify an issue, subsidy may be compromised. So obviously this becomes a vicious cycle if repairs are not um, carried out. With staff, uh, typically you see uh, you know, these, these roles, supers, porters, ground keepers, in terms of admin, um, you know, starting to get into some of these nuances of tenant participation funds. These are discretionary funds, uh, discretionary um, uh, accounts that are set up in partnership with the developer to serve the needs of the tenant association. Is it a day, uh, a day festival? Is it a performance? Is it um, you know, programming for literacy? Uh, all of these services are typically funded through tenant participation uh, funds and again can be worked and, and negotiated as long as the, the, the tenant association knows what they need. Uh, I know we're short on time, so uh, we, we can skip this, this part, uh, breaking down kind of uh, essential design uh, pillars. Um, and for the next piece, we'll get into distribution. Yeah, so as we move forward, uh... CEI to the toolkit um, will be assessed as distributed uh, in various forms, uh, including a web-based platform, uh, which, will be, which will reflect uh, the evolving nature, nature of our work um, as we move forward uh, in redefining our methodology and expanding uh, our partnerships, institutional and local uh, collaborators. Uh, we've also been looking into um, analog ways of distributing this information, what is the best way to represent it, and make it more into digestible bytes since it's so complex um, and convoluted, particularly 
since policy around the city at state level, infodral keeps changing, making the complicated the process more complicated. Um, and also thinking through research literature and graphics and how this is presented uh, uh, local nonprofit uh, uh, organizations uh, and uh, meetings, but also local community boards uh, and their uh, efforts to engage with the city and the state officials. And lastly, clinic distribution, which is more uh, on site at this uh, either uh, in local uh, Harlem, uh, East Harlem, or the Bronx, um, creating a, a local presence, working with nonprofits uh, to get people more engaging, uh, engaged in this work. And yeah. Yeah, so we, we'd love to learn from some of the folks that have been doing this for a while now. We're still very young, but excited to carry out this work. Um, here are our email contacts and our Instagram, which slowly building, <laughs> promise. Uh, but uh, again, we're excited to carry out some of this work and, and thank you, looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Luis and Nelson. I'm so sorry, we always we're, we're always feeling very tight on time with every presentation, but I just wanted to make sure we had time for questions. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question mm -hmm. because you mentioned how, how overwhelming it can be to try and enter into this development space, especially for less experience. And as we all know, like if you don't have role models, if you're not learning from the people yep. around you who aren't doing this, um, how are you thinking about engaging the, the stakeholders in developing this literature? Yeah, so part of the, the joy of kind of stepping into the first professional role following graduate school is um, that you are able to identify things that just happen through the work. Mm -hmm. um, and so in doing uh, our work, mm -hmm. we are able to engage with um, a number of tenant associations. Um, I've been at a number of town hall meetings where, you know, it's, we're talking to Zareth, maybe three people, <laughs> you know, and there's a tamale distribution event in her case, not to jump on that. Um, but, you know, part of, part of the, the work is kind of showing up and engaging um, and understanding what the pipeline is for some of these deals, such that if, if uh, a certain cluster of buildings is going to be developed next, then we know which developments to uh, tackle because they're part of a building um, renovation effort. So right. there is a pipeline in the agent at the agency level that we can tap into in doing our work to engage at, you know, at the local level. Great. Does anyone else have questions? Anyone else have questions? No? Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we've, uh, we've attended, we've uh, communicated with uh, the North Bronx uh, Community Land Trust, mm -hmm. which is, so this is where we've started to uh, communicate. Land, community Land Trust uh, inherently is about owning land, public land that can be transferred to the community for management. But now that the city um, is doing more land leases, so in the long term, it will go back to city unless the lease is extended. Uh, so working with uh, nonprofits to see how this land lease that's currently in place in the city could benefit and also work with uh, North Bronx community, but also other community land trusts that are uh, happening around in the South Bronx that are either pushing to use abandoned or underutilized um, properties for to be transferred to um, community non land trust to then uh, so definitely some communication starting how we can navigate the process to make it work for this local community group. Thank you so much. And that's actually another great segue to Fabrizio and Catherine who have been um, attending community Sorry. meetings and um, have will be sharing about some of their advances using that strategy um, for their uni wi fi unwified uni wi fi project. project. Thank you. Hey, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Fabrizio Puriassi. I'm an architect and a graduate of the AD program at Columbia GSAP. I work at the intersection of design and research. I currently teach architectural history theory and design studio at Parsons School of Design in New York. I'm also a PhD candidate in architectural history and design um, at the University of Basel in Switzerland, where I'm studying uh, marginalized histories of urbanization in Southern Italy. Uh, I'm Catherine Ahn. I'm working with Fabrizio on the Uni Wi-Fi project, which we'll talk more about shortly. 
Uh, I'm an architect and researcher currently working at Andrew Franz Architect, and uh, I was a 2020 fellow at the Institute for Public Architecture, where I studied community engagement in industrial mass path at Newtown Creek. Um, and I also researched about feminist pedagogies with the support of the Princeton Mellon Initiative. So we each have about 10 years of working experience in architecture firms and cultural institutions in the US and abroad. Uh, we uh, together run distributed architecture, which is a research and design practice that we launched in 2021 to try to bring our contribution to the discipline of architecture towards a more inclusive and collaborative design practice. Um, as we come from very different cultural backgrounds, uh, I was born and raised in Italy, uh, Catherine grew up in Korea, discourse and exchange are central to our collaboration. As an extension of this discursive method, we are exploring participatory processes in design and teaching uh, that are helping us to defining and recalibrating uh, the design and research directions of our practice. So these are some pictures uh, from a collaborative design unit that we taught this summer at the Architectural Association Visiting School in Seoul. Today, we would like to talk about our project the Uni Wi-Fi, which is currently under development in Harlem and was initiated one year ago, thanks to the support of the GISAP Incubator Prize. In summary, the project aims to bring a free high quality internet access to underserved communities in Harlem, mostly living in pre-war low rise buildings, which have fallen through the cracks of several internet initiatives. We have intentionally developed the, pro the project uh, in a slow, open and discursive manner so that we are uh, thinking, uh, um, our thinking is evolving as we engage with the communities. This made for a nonlinear development process, but one full of discoveries and rich conversations with a growing number of residents and also architects, artists, and uh, other people, uh, uh, organizations uh, operating in Harlem and in New York City. We started the project during the pandemic, which illuminated the particular social and infrastructural issues. We learned that the lower income households and neighborhoods in New York, particularly with black and Latinx demographics, face the systemic lack of access to the social infrastructure, which also includes a bit uh, built infrastructure. More specifically, the lack of access to stable internet connection severely impacted the learning of students who rely on it for school and elderly people in need of vaccines or other medical information or social services that entirely moved online. Our project began, began with a desire to help these communities to bridge the digital divide, which widened during the pandemic uh, by bringing positive changes into the built environment through design. Our initial research began with gathering the data online. We read annual community board statements, which report that the technological upgrade and internet access are in dire need in Central and East Harlem, which then led us to further research of inequity, about inequities in internet access. This map shows the percentage of households without internet access in New York City. When you see the darker colors, means that there is less accessibility. You can see that East and Central Harlem are two of Manhattan's least connected, connected districts. We found the 2019 data that indicated that 25.8% of households in East and Central Harlem lack access to internet, which is well above Manhattan's 11.7% average. In parallel, we also read about the work of NYC Mesh, uh, which is a grassroots organization run by volunteers that in the last 10 years has brought high quality internet to over a thousand locations in New York City at very minimal cost. As shown with dots in this map, Mesh has nodes mostly in Brooklyn and lower Manhattan right now. With our project, we hope that we can contribute to expand their network to the Northern side of Manhattan. In more technical terms, Mesh installs Wi-Fi nodes on rooftops, which receive signals from super nodes that are located in strategic sites in neighborhoods. Each new node reinforces the existing ones. So in a sense, their technology mirrors the social aspiration of building a community by empowering each person one node at a time. We consider this as an important part of the project uh, as we found a technological partner that shares our mission in a field dominated by profit-driven corporations. To connect with Mesh uh, um, took some time. 
we attended one of the non their monthly meetups uh, and talked with the volunteers uh, about our project. The reception was very good, and uh, this gave us confidence in moving forward to pursuing uh, a collaboration with them. Uh, through a series of referrals, we connected to Rob Johnson, who is pictured in this photo with Catherine, and is also here with us today. Uh, Rob is an engineer working uh, uh, at various, uh, uh, on various internet initiatives for New York State, and is also a volunteer of NYC Mesh. Like me, is a resident of Harlem and has already installed several nodes uh, in the neighborhood. So working with Rob, we uh, learned a lot about how Mesh operates and also the context of Harlem, which affected the development of the entire project. At the beginning, in fact, we imagined to install antenna structures, we call them this way, on streets and sidewalks uh, to provide the free internet for residents in contrast uh, with other initiatives like Link NYC that maybe you are familiar with uh, that also provide the free internet in streets, uh, but only in commercial avenues, uh, which uh, fail uh, and failing to serve the residential communities in need. Now we envision a larger and diffused internet infrastructure uh, with uh, various uh, types of devices uh, to be located not only in residential streets, but also in rooftops and parks. We imagine these devices are community specific uh, and designed together with the residents. The process is currently ongoing, um, but we already imagine these structures to be constructed in light metal with stabilizing plinths and cladded with solar panels and ceramic tiles produced in collaboration with local artists. Through these devices, we aim to make visible signs of change in Harlem and amplify the voices of marginalized communities through constructive and creative means. Uh, one of our goals is to design sculptural and culturally grounded structures that people can actually feel ownership over. So explorations around the neighborhood became an important part of our design process. Um, which allowed us to understand the multitude of urban conditions in central Harlem. Uh, through walking the streets and engaging with diverse actors in Harlem, we realized that each block is a kind of city within a city with its own block association, um, micro communities and its own cultures. So connecting and working together with communities at multiple levels, um, both block by block and with Central Harlem as a whole became an important strategy for the project. We conducted several interviews and conversations with residents, activists, architects, and entrepreneurs. And we also presented to Central Harlem's Community Board Parks Committee Economic Development Committee and Transportation Committees. Uh, we received very positive feedback and encouragement. And these uh, conversations and presentations taught us a lot about um, a community specific needs and aspirations far beyond what we could learn just through online research. Many of the residents reached out to us during and after the presentations, which led to new connections, new installation opportunities, and new insights about community dynamics. Um, thanks to the funds of GSAP Incubator Prize, we were able to install uh, two test nodes in central Harlem in June and July of this year. And through these sites, we're uh, monitoring and better understanding the coverage and the strength of the internet connections provided by NYC Mesh. The first node was installed at Open Street West 120th Street, which is a designated car-free area uh, and hosts a variety of community-oriented events like meditation, uh, yoga, and movie nights. And then the second node was installed at St. Aloysius Church on 132nd Street um, with much success. And we hope to install other nodes to eventually cover the entire block. Um, recently, we received additional funds from the Architectural League of New York and New York State Council on the Arts. And as our next step, we'd like to install a more publicly accessible node in Jackie Robinson Park um, which is a site we became aware of through interviews with activists and the community board discussions, and also through walking around in Harlem. This will be a highly visible node, so architecture will play an important role in broadening the recognition of these community-owned and community-based structures. Um, and this park is very close to the Sugar Hill Children's Museum, as well as the City College of New York, 
both of which currently host a NYC mesh supernode. Um, and because of the topography of the Jack and Jackie Robinson Park, we think that the site can successfully receive signals from both supernodes and be able to provide several free Wi-Fi access points throughout the park. Um, we'll be donating the Wi-Fi nodes in the park, both the devices and the structures to the communities for free. Um, we're very interested in shifting internet service from major providers to low cost community owned systems. And as the part, uh, as for the next phase, we're seeking to incorporate contributions from local artists. So we'll reach out to cultural institutions like the Studio Museum in Harlem to create a brief uh, and open call to connect with artists. Um, we'll also be reaching out to structural engineering firms as well as fabrication shops to develop design iterations and construction details. Um, and begin a dialogue with the New York City Parks Department to obtain any required approvals. And we've also started a conversation with the Van Allen Institute about the possibility of creating public events, which we'd like to host in conjunction with the installation of new nodes sometime next year. Um, so by demonstrating that alternative infrastructural models are possible and engaging communities along the process, we hope that the devices will serve as catalysts for expanding self-sustained internet infrastructure, which centers and empowers residents and communities. And um, as Fabrizio mentioned, we see the project as an, a kind of open-ended exploration, which has already evolved quite a bit through the conversations and by immersing ourselves into the urban and social contexts in central Harlem. Um, we've learned an incredible amount through a labyrinthine uh, path of discovery, which we, could have, we couldn't have foreseen prior to delving into the project. Um, and lastly, we'd like to express our sincere gratitude to Columbia GSEP for supporting this project and all the wonderful people we've met along the way, as you can see here. Um, and in particular, we'd like to thank Leslie Kuo and her team and Rob Johnson from NYC Mesh for their generous support and efforts throughout this past year. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was, um, I've said to you before how impressed I am with like your, your direct engagement with the community and really as, um, as Luis said previously, you know, just showing up and going to the community meetings and finding that way to um, work with them and figure out how to actually realize the project. Um, and it's really exciting to just know that you guys are on, you guys have built this momentum in a short time and, you know, where you're taking it to like Seoul and through the other organizations that are supporting the advancement of the project. So kudos to you as well. So thank you so much for, for contributing to the community like this. Are there any questions? Do you have a question? Uh, <clears throat> this is really, really innovative, like thinking about like the structures as sculptures. Um, I'm curious about like your design process, like how you kind of translated the community's uh, needs into, into the final products. Okay, um, right now the impact of the solar are only uh, some ideas that we have, but we are still in the process of really design structures for the community. So we imagine that, that we will have different, uh, several uh, iterations of the design. So also, as Kevin mentioned, we will uh, launch a call to uh, involve artists, local artists, uh, to contribute to the design of the structures so that the people can actually feel uh, uh, ownership. We hope that the people could feel ownership of the structures. There's one thing that could make your presentation a little more because I, I don't quite, there's something I don't really quite understand, um, which is that like if someone wants to get internet in Harlem, they can get it, right? They, they can get fires to come to their house. Is that correct? Um, you can, the option is you can either pay money or else you use your system, which is much cheaper because it's a mesh network and it's joined with the community. Like that wasn't 100% clear to me. 
here, the one option versus the other. Like you're taking me you're taking for granted everybody knows what a mesh network is. I mean, I would bet if you ask people over here to define a mesh network. You'd be uh, obviously <laughs> <laughs> helping out. Yeah, so but I mean, that's yeah. like really and critical. And I'm not sure if you want to yeah, in most cases, it's just a cost issue, and that's it's right. then we that's translated into an ownership and a yeah. and a sort of community issue, right. and so that's their I think approach is. So I, I think that in, no, I think right? that it's this is in trust. It's like once the artist is with the artist, you know, it's also an artist generation. Yes. Yeah. I think that in this transitional moment, uh, the role of the architect, uh, of our role, uh, what we imagined is to make, uh, to visualize the possibility of, of an alternative infrastructure. So we imagine the structures to be temporary. Not necessarily like uh, uh, that we right. install something that stays Building forever. Yeah. What we discovered by interviewing the people is that a, uh, a lot of people don't know about the opportunity of having a free Wi-Fi through the mesh system. So this is why we think that our project can be important to make the people aware about this possibility. And uh, uh, you want to add something else? Adding a layer. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you. We are going to start the last section on storytelling and I'm happy to um, introduce Cheryl who will be talking about her reflective urbanisms um, in Chinatown New York. Okay, so hi, I'm Cheryl Wingsy Wong and I guess I'd like to start first with a land acknowledgement. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that Manhattan's Chinatown which is where my project is focused on is the traditional unceded territory of the Lenape people. And I'd also just to like to pay respects to indigenous elders of the past, present and future who have stewarded this land for generations. So my project is called Reflective Urbanisms Mapping New York Chinatown. It's a project I've been developing this year with major support from the Laundromat Project and their Create Change Artist Residency. And today I'll be sharing just some of my process and work in progress. A little bit about my background, I'm an artist and a trained architect, and my own creative practice is really at this intersection between the two disciplines. And in my work, I'm interested in exploring how spaces can change over time and how community stories are connected to architecture. So this project is an interactive multimedia website that's part of a continuing series researching Chinatown buildings across North America. Reflective Urbanism's Mapping New York Chinatown is really focused on telling stories about Manhattan Chinatown's community through its architecture. So I'm cataloging the changes that its buildings have undergone over time through collecting oral histories and photographing the physical structures and their community members. I'm also working on creating 3D models of the buildings in order to visualize the major transformations over the past century. And then these oral histories are then tied to the buildings in a 3D map. So for me, as a restorative history project, it aims to build community empowerment through sharing stories and creating an architectural archive that honors and connects these stories to the buildings. So here in New York, we happen to have no shortage of Chinatowns. We have nine Chinatowns. But in this edition of the project, I see big eyes from that fact. <laughs> um, in this edition of the project, I'm focusing on the oldest one, the historic core of Manhattan's Chinatown. Personally, I've had a longstanding connection to Chinatowns in the US. I grew up going on biweekly trips to LA's Chinatown with my parents. In recent years, I've installed public artworks in Chinatowns in the US and in Canada, including pavilions and seating for creating new community hubs. And in New York, I live in Manhattan's Chinatown. So this is my neighborhood and this is my community. And while archival documentation helps us understand a place's past, there are still large parts of Chinatown's history that remain missing. 
These buildings aren't just structures, they're places of resilience for generations of community members. Many of the personal stories of the people who have lived, worked, started families, built and renovated and frequented for a connection to home far away in these Chinatown buildings, they just haven't been recorded. There's a bittersweet reality to the history of Chinatowns. Their enclaves founded upon a history of racism and exclusion. Yet over time, they're also places that have flourished into vibrant communities. Since the start of the pandemic though, there's been a lot of racist, anti-Asian rhetoric and violence that has continued to disproportionately impact our Chinatown communities. Manhattan Chinatown is shrinking as longtime businesses and residents are forced out by gentrification and rising rents. And within family associations, elders are passing away. So it's really a crucial time to remember our stories and to rewrite our own history. The first part of my research has really been to observe the buildings by walking around and exploring them, moving around them, looking at their details and documenting them from different perspectives. A building facade has so much meaning. It really tells us how the building faces the city. It tells us how it represents itself to the world. There's so much we can understand from the exterior of a building. And what does it say about who it's catering to? What does it say about ownership? How do we enter the building? How do we look inside it? How do materials tell a story about the building's past? How do ornamental features communicate stories about culture? Is the signage a major feature or is it just a subtle whisper on the building? And how does the building announce that it's part of Chinatown? But it's not just about the exterior. For my project, it's also about the details of life inside these buildings. So these are photos taken inside various buildings in Manhattan Chinatown and many within family association buildings. And just to explain a little bit about what those are, associations are community organizations whose members are tied by a commonality, which is usually either the same ancestral village back in China or a same last name, like the Li Association or the Wong Association, for example. There are other associations that have developed along the way to help entrepreneurs or to mediate as governing bodies over fellow associations. And the interesting thing is that many of these associations have over a hundred years of history in Manhattan Chinatown. They purchased their buildings in the early 1900s and made it a place where members could gather. They've been lifelines historically for new Chinese immigrants and they form a deep part of Chinatown, providing support through lodging, through food, jobs and help with paperwork to become an American citizen. And today with Chinatown's footprint shrinking, it's even more important that these family associations are property owners in the historic core. You know, so for me, being invited inside these buildings and being able to document them has been an emotional experience. These interiors tell us so much about Chinatown's community. They tell us about how owning a building in the city also means feeding a village. Many association buildings have an industrial kitchen where they prepare feasts for special occasions. And for those who don't, every association always has a carafe of steaming tea one of coffee and a warm pot of rice so fellow members never go hungry. They tell us how a family shrine has historically been one of the first dedicated spaces within these buildings and how the goddess Guan Yin and a legacy of ancestors are remembered and worshiped here. How guidance is given on life's mysteries through fortune telling. How the instruments, calligraphy, and cultural arts of the past are not forgotten, but displayed prominently. How past leaders and predecessors are honored. How teaching is also a form of community remembrance, of keeping Chinatown strong by not forgetting its more challenging times. So here in this image, it's the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association building on Mott Street where the history of Chinese immigration in America and the founding of Chinatown is remembered in a permanent public exhibition on the second floor. On the upper floors, there are Chinese language classes held year round to keep our linguistic culture alive. They also tell us about how these interior spaces can hold stories of generations past. At Ting's gift shop today, 
there are ceramics stocked on these shelves. But these shelves predate the 1940s when they used to carry jars of tiger balm and herbal medicine in a doctor's office. As part of my research, I also held community engagement sessions where the public was invited to share their stories of Chinatown buildings. So over tea and snacks, memories were shared about Chinatown of the past. In this image, you see this duo of benches, which was designed to host these events. And the idea is that these seats can be reconfigured for different scenarios and the nooks and corners invite us to find new ways to dialogue. During these storytelling circles, these benches were installed outdoors in historic Columbus Park and on Doyer Street. And at these events, I heard stories about folks growing up in tenements now demolished on Bayard Street, about attending Chinese school for over a decade on Mott Street and partying at epic wedding banquets at restaurants no longer there, Port Arthur, China Lane. And following these events this past spring, the benches were donated to China Partnership to liven up public spaces in Manhattan Chinatown. I also spent a lot of time one-on-one -on -one with community members to walk through their buildings together to conduct interviews and record their stories. Many of these folks have been in the neighborhood for a long time. Some have worked on major renovations of the buildings. Some have taken it over from their parents. But with each interview, I also capture a portrait of the person within their building. So these are the portraits of the caretakers, the owners, the residents, and the stewards of our Chinatown buildings. So by observing the building in its current day state, we can understand a lot. But with this project, it's also about piecing together clues on what the building was like before and how it's changed over time. So this involves looking at old floor plans, old architectural drawings. And sometimes these plans exist in city archives and sometimes the building stewards were able to dig up old rolls of drawings from their basements. But with a lot of buildings, there's nothing. If all, you know, all that might remain is, if you're lucky, is just one old photograph. And while we can't always understand the three-dimensional aspects of a building, we can still understand a part of the story by seeing the former footprint of a building that gives us an idea of what was there before. This is a detail from New York City's 1905 Sanborn fire insurance maps. And you can see in the early 1900s that Chinatown was much more sparse than it is today, at least in its documented form. We don't really know what the reality is. There are only a handful of recorded Chinese businesses spread across the area. My research is also dependent on the work of my predecessors, whether they're publications on the history of Chinese America or archival photographs or self-published catalogs put up by family associations. So currently in the project, we're wrapping up the 3D modeling of today's Chinatown. And these are some work in progress renders here. And in this view, we're looking north on Mott Street. You know, in this process, it's been a bit sad because we're finding out that more and more businesses have been affected by the pandemic and are closing down in the last year. So there's been a major change happening just in the past two years. And this render looks south on Mott Street and shows some of the historic restaurants that have been located here for over the last half a century. Just a little bit of an interesting fact, something that I noticed from my interviews and visits to buildings that we're trying to reflect more accurately in the models is that each association strategically announces its political alliance to either Taiwan or mainland China through the flags displayed on the building exterior. You'll notice this when you're walking on the street. So in this render at the far end of the image, you can see that the associate, association there, which is the Eng Sui Sun Association, has declared its allegiance to Taiwan. And sometimes associations right next door to each other will have conflicting political alliances. So using research from these interviews, municipal tax photographs and architectural drawings, we're also creating models of past iterations of the building and connecting these iterations together to really try to understand how the building has changed over time. These elevations show the west side of Mott Street between Moscow and Bayard in 1940 and in current day. When the final project is complete in this website, you'll be able to scroll through the different notable chapters that we know of at least within a building's history. 
And these digital models will also be incorporated into a real-time 3D space online so that you can navigate and fly around the buildings and learn more about their stories. If we take a closer look at 41 Mott Street, we can see how the building's different chapters tell us a story about changes in ownership and changes in political era. I'm gonna read a quote uh, from my interview with Carrie Coulain, architectural historian. Built in the early 1920s, this building was the first new construction commissioned by a Chinatown association, one of the most powerful at the time, the On Learn Tong. The building designed by white architect Richard Raman, since there were no practicing Chinese architects in New York at the time, was commissioned to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the Chinese revolution in 1911. It was of the shop house typology with a tiled Chinese roof and inset galleries on the second and sixth floor. It included a restaurant for the public at the ground floor, dining facilities for club members on the second and third floor, sleeping accommodations for members on floors four and five, and a meeting room and library at the top floor. The layers of history in this building demonstrated the economic and political power of the onlearn in the 1920s. By the early 1940s, architects reworked the pagoda-like roof at the sixth floor into a highly ornamented, squared off marquees that would expand the usable space for the association's top floor meeting spaces. And in the late 1940s, the On Learn Chinese Merchants Association commissioned their new building headquarters up the street at 83 Mott. And by the late 1970s, they decided to sell off the building at 41 Mott Street to the Lee Family Association, who remodeled it in the early 80s. And this remodel featured a very minimalist, modernist facade by China-born architect Wei Fu Chen, who was also the designer of Confucius Plaza, at a time when overtly Chinese architectural expression was no longer the preferred mode for Chinatown's association buildings. Here in this photo you see at the center, Ho Q Lee, a community member who's a former president and a current elder and building steward of the Lee Family Association at 41 Mott Street. And during our interview in person, he really spent a while describing his journey immigrating to New York Chinatown from Hong Kong during the mid 60s. And this was the time when Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965 opened up large scale Chinese immigration to the US, which had previously been severely restricted by the Chinese Exclusion Act. Ho Q Lee took over his father's poultry business as soon as he came to New York and ended up actually battling years of racist politics with the USDA that prevented him from selling chicken slaughtered in a style familiar for Chinese cooking and requested by Chinatown restaurants. He turned to both the CCBA, the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association, and the Lee Association to help advocate for him, to help him strategize, write letters, and liaise with the city government on his behalf, ultimately winning the case. And this was then afterwards called a Buddhist style cut. So here are a few of his words. Since the day I immigrated to New York City in 1965, I've been a Lee Association member. My father was already a part of the association. Since the late 1990s, elderly members have been passing away, so I decided that I needed to step up. I was still working on my wholesale poultry business at the time, but both the poultry workers and the Lee Association told me, if you take care of your business, you won't be able to properly take care of the association. I was 61 years old at the time, and in the end, I sold off my business in 2000 and chose to focus on the Lee Association. So in the past few years, I've been doing this body of resilience work focused on North American Chinatowns. I just wanted to share two links for these other projects, the top one being reflectiveurbanisms.com. It's the predecessor website that maps Calgary Chinatown's architecture. So you can go on that, scroll through the 3D map and get a sense for what we're doing here in Manhattan's Chinatown. The second is a digital publication called Musings from Chinatown, Peri Pandemic Notes on Resilience, which is a bilingual Chinese English digital publication that features contributions from American and Canadian Chinatown community members on how to stay resilient and how to remember the stories of our Chinatowns. So Reflective Urbanism's Mapping New York Chinatown, that project website is in development and expected to be live by early next year. So stay tuned for that. Lastly, I thought it would be fitting to end with this image of four generations of Wongs within the Wong Association and the cutest baby on the planet on the right side. That's my daughter, but I'm not biased at all. <laughs> um, 
Reflective urbanism is just a, a part of this body of resilience work. It responds to the hardship of, that our Chinatowns have endure, endured in recent years. And while it doesn't resolve all of these challenges, I do believe that we can build community resilience and further cement Chinatown's cultural legacy by documenting the histories of this systematically marginalized place and its people. Thank you so much, Cheryl. I mean, personally, I, having grown up going to Chinatowns, this I think is um, a reflection of both your architectural training, your ability to talk about place and space in a way that, that in, in that way that you do, as well as your ability to connect with the communities. Of course, you belong to this community, but um, I think I want to also acknowledge nationwide this um, trend of support to include Asian American history in public school curriculum now, including New York City. I think just seeing the interiors of some of these buildings is completely my first time experience. Um, and so eye-opening and I hope that your project can be part of this um, growing body of, of academic work for public school children, so including your daughter and my children too. <laughs> um, I, we have one, we have only time for one question. Does anyone have a question? Um, I really appreciate the kind of on the ground localist depth and interest. I did notice, and I'm wondering, this may be kind of uh, not quite relevant, but on Doyer Street, the New York City uh, Department of Transportation, I think, has done the paving and the kind of pedestrianizing that they like to be doing. I'm wondering how you feel or how some of your neighbors feel about the relationships and what's created there. Well, it's new, this whole like open streets thing that Doyers is permanently like a pedestrian passageway now. And I think it's wonderful. I mean, I did a lot of those community engagement events right on Doria Street. And I know intimately some of the business owners there and they've had their facades like literally crashed into by cars. It feels dangerous. So it's really fantastic to have a place dedicated for pedestrians to just be there. I think it's great. And I think the Chinatown Partnership is also doing a lot of work to activate them through floor murals, which I think is also cool, like bringing public art into the environment and having that activate the space in a way that's different. Sure, yeah, this is Kemi and she is the executive director of the Laundromat Project. I've been really grateful to work with Kemi a few years ago on the Laundromat Project Create Change Fellowship and this year on the artist residency She's amazing and incredible, and I have only positive <laughs> words for her. And this is Wellington Chen. He's the executive director. So these are my favorite EDs in the room, by the way. <laughs> so Wellington is the executive director of the Chinatown Partnership, the Chinatown Bid. He has done so much to advocate for our Chinatown and actually different Chinatowns across North America. Been working closely with him also to host these community engagement events, to deploy the benches, and to really make sure that public art is a way to bring community together within Manhattan's Chinatown. Hey everybody, my name is Adam Susnick. Um, I run the project Segregation by Design, um, which currently takes the form of a website um, where I'm trying, and an Instagram account uh, and Twitter, account where I'm trying to document the 180 cities that got federal money for uh, the interstate for interstate construction as well as urban renewal and some clearance. Um, and so far I've covered um, 12 cities. I'm currently working on Chicago. Um, I'm actually speaking at um, Crown Hall or at um, uh, UIC or no, um, Illinois Institute of Technology next month uh, about Crown Hall, which was built on top of uh, a black neighborhood uh, and a, a building called Mecca Flats. Um, but so what I'm gonna do today is, um, I think Leslie might've just mentioned that I had an article in the New York Times recently. Um, so 
Uh, for those of you who have read it, this might be a little familiar, um, but I'm basically going to be going over the thesis of my project um, using just examples from various cities that I've covered so far. Um, so I'll get started. So um, I'm going to start in the present. Um, so Houston, this is Houston. Um, Houston is encircled by interstates, um, which divide the city along racial lines. The third ward, the historic heart of the black community in Houston is entirely surrounded by freeways. Um, rather than pursuing ways to lessen this divide, the city is actually currently spending $10 billion to widen the freeways. Um, as seen here, this is the right of way. So the Clayton homes, which you can see whoops, right here, um, right here, are in that right of way. It's a public housing facility that houses mostly black and Latino residents, um, 483 families, um, and they will be uh, forcibly displaced by the Texas DOT, um, as well as approximately 530 more, um, or 430 more um, uh, market rate units. Um, so since the mid 20th century, urban highway construction has worked as a powerful tool to segregate American cities and demolish communities of color. These roadways built on the legacy of redlining, creating walls of concrete and smog that separate black and brown communities from white, um, as well as Chinatowns. Um, absolutely, I have some examples of that as well. Um, while the period of government-led segregation is discussed as history, um, projects like this one in Houston um, reveal that it is anything but. And actually, this if you can see my cursor, this region here, or where this intersection was, um, was Houston's original Chinatown, and a lot of it was taken out by this intersection, or by this interchange. Um, so in addition to the fact that these projects are still ongoing, um, for the communities that are divided by these highways, considerable public uh, health impacts persist. So this is the Bronx, the South Bronx, um, and the West Bronx, which is uh, totally surrounded by um, freeways, the cross Bronx coming through up there. Um, and the noise pollution coming off of it for the thousands of people that live uh, in the apartments is um, often louder than a vacuum cleaner. Uh, and then in addition, recent um, scholarship actually at uh, the uh, mailman school, the public health school, uh, I've been working with Professor Peter Munich, and he had a paper um, directly linking the particulate matter from the exhaust of the traffic on the freeways that surround the Bronx, across the South Bronx, with the fact that the census tracts in the South Bronx all basically have been, are in the 99th percentile for asthma prevalence, which you can see here. Um, moreover, this one's not my graphic. All the other ones are, but uh, induced demand is a bit tough to, dis to explain. But moreover, at this point, decades of evidence has shown that widening freeways doesn't, does very little to relieve traffic, uh, that the traffic fills up very quickly. Uh, and in some cases, it can actually make it worse. Um, and unfortunately, rather than being a rare exception, uh, projects like Texas's fit a longstanding pattern of how the United States chooses to force highways through communities with the least political power to resist. Um, so the first of these, so now I'm going back in history, the first of these urban freeways uh, really was the Cross Bronx um, built in the late 40s, uh, just started just after uh, World War II, designed by Robert Moses. Um, and this was, what's was so important about this one was this was the first urban highway built through an existing city. And it wasn't just an existing city, it was New York. Um, and this displaced over 40,000 people in some of the most racially integrated neighborhoods in the United States. Um, and I have a video that I can show. Here, so this is an animation of it being built. And so for some context, what these are, where I get these images is th these are aerial surveys uh, undertaken by the Army Air Force in the 30s. Um, and then compare, uh, compared with another one that was done in the 80s. Um, so what I do is I stitch, all, it's, it's a bunch of different plates. Um, so I stitch them together and then colorize um, the water and some of the parks just for legibility. The idea is to be able to really compare it with um, Google Maps as, we, as we're used to viewing it today. So that's the Cross Bronx. Jump back to the presentation. 
Okay. Yeah. So unfortunately, the Cross Bronx served as a model for other cities that were looking to develop their own highway networks after President Eisenhower signed the Federal Aid Highway Act in 1956. Um, so what this bill did was it actually provided a 90% federal match for freeway construction. So what that means is if you're a city, this is Philly, if you're a city and you want to upgrade uh, a road to um, federal highway, or if you want to do a road project, if you upgrade it to federal highway standards, that means the government then comes in and pays for the federal government then comes in and pays for 90% of it, um, which is an unprecedented uh, level of federal investment in cities that has never been matched. Um, and this that that 56 bill is really a large reason why we have such an insane amount of uh, freeway coverage in this country. Um, and again, the, the cross Bronx really cross Bronx really did serve as a model uh, for other cities. Here's some other examples. So uh, here's Philly, Boston. You can see the whole West End was destroyed, um, as well as Roxbury, Chicago. The south and west sides, as well as the near north side, were particularly hardly hit. Um, uh, and it's not just uh, cities that we think of as older, um, or the cities that we think of as like, uh, you know, as um, having grown up before the car. Uh, it's this is Houston before the freeways came in, um, and it also had I don't have the map here, but it, it had a dense streetcar network as well. Um, and you can see it really hollows out. Buffalo, Atlanta. Um, so these highways uh, sliced through downtown areas and made possible the development of new car-centric suburbs on the outskirts of existing cities. Um, this is an advertisement for one such suburb. I mean, Levittown's a very famous one. Um, but the real estate industry's widespread use of what were called restrictive covenants ensured that these new suburbs were closed for anybody considered non-white. Um, so what a restrictive, and this, this is in Long Island, but this happened in every, everywhere across the country from the San Francisco Bay Area to Minneapolis to Salt Lake, everywhere to Miami. Um, so what these were is it was a clause in the deed of houses, of, of new suburban houses, um, that prohibited sale to anybody uh, considered non-white. Um, and that was the language they used, you can see here on the right. Uh, so these practices uh, encouraged and exacerbated uh, white flight and racial segregation. Um, and in the ensuing years, uh, the American, American cities entered a period of significant decay as tax bases dried up um, and cities cut back on municipal services. Uh, and thus begins the era of urban renewal uh, in the late 50s. Um, also sponsored by federal legislation, um, which provided a two-thirds match for slum clearance and urban renewal, City used the decay, cities used the decay as an excuse to remake their civic cores for the convenience of the suburban white commuter. Um, this is the West End in Boston, which was totally leveled, um, partially for parking, parking facilities for Mass General, um, as well as for large institutional buildings. Um, and Black neighborhoods were targeted with such regularity and intensity that James Baldwin famously said, um, urban renewal means Negro removal. That is what it means. And the federal government is an accomplice to this fact. Um, so what this chart is showing is that it's showing the disproportionate impact of urban renewal on the non-white community. So for instance, because what, what often gets brought up is um, many white people were displaced, that is true. Um, but if you look at the fact, so let me explain. So Philadelphia, for instance, at the time of urban renewal, uh, about 20% of its population was non-white, but about 70% of those displaced were of color. Um, so it ends up in many cities, it, I mean, up here in many cities, it affects almost 100% of the, of the non-white population. Um, so cities, paved over vibrant neighborhoods and replaced them with amenities focused on suburban commuters, commuters uh, in this case, a government complex. Uh, this is uh, Nubian Square, used to be uh, formerly Dudley Square in the heart of Roxbury um, in Boston, um, which is the historic heart of Boston's black community. That's actually the official government motto of it. Um, and 
in the 70s, they tore most of it down, including this um, church that was led, that had a black congregation. Um, and they also tore out the subway. Um, so here's another example in Atlanta, um, where the black neighborhood of Mechanicsville um, was demolished for the Fulton count for this interchange here, as well as for the Fulton County Stadium, which was later demolished because um, stadia, of course, quickly go obsolete. Um, so this is a bit of an aside, but additionally, after the government had poured so much money into freeway construction and automobile infrastructure, transit agencies began to become, began to become unprofitable. Uh, and rather than have the government take over as many European and Asian countries did, as well as Australia, uh, the US actively encouraged legacy transit to fail by um, pouring so much into automobile infrastructure. And by the time um, municipal control did happen, uh, much of the local rail transit had already been dismantled. Um, so this is an example uh, from Philadelphia, of, uh, and just another example of urban renewal. This is um, UPenn. I was actually presenting there earlier, which is why there's a bunch of stuff on UPenn. Um, but the, yeah, UPenn with federal money, um, as well as Drexel, um, bought most of this, or, or was able to use eminent domain um, to clear out this neighborhood known as Black Bottom um, and replace it with institutional facilities. Here's some more images. Um, and this is you know, a good moment to talk about sort of, um, I colorize some of these images. So these are actual black and white images uh, and it's for the purpose of comparative clarity. Uh, here's another image. And what's kind of fun, it, what's kind of interesting about this project is they didn't go around taking images, like taking photos of um, non-white, of, of urban neighborhoods from the air back in the day, um, but they did on special occasions. So often these photos will have some sort of cool nugget. So for instance, you see this thing here, that's actually the shadow of the Hindenburg flying over, um, flying over Philadelphia in 1936. Um, and you can see, this is that neighborhood that was completely destroyed. Um, so the urban highway network and the urban renewal projects it spawned are tools of systemic discrimination uh, and racism. They're also in terrible shape. The American Society of Civil Engineers give the net, gives the network a D minus grade, the interstate. Um, given that now is the perfect opportunity to rethink this network. Um, in practice, this may mean dismantling much of it wholesale. Um, luckily, some places have shown that change is possible. Um, this is Utrecht in the Netherlands. Um, this was a canal that circled the city uh, that they in the 80s or in the 70s um, covered up with a, a freeway. Uh, and they've since removed it uh, and invested heavily in um, transit and, and bikeability and walkability. Um, same thing here. This is an example in Seoul. Unfortunately, it's really hard to find before pictures of this project because I don't think they want you to see them because uh, it was pretty bad. But um, they so this was an elevated highway that covered uh, a stream uh, in downtown, like right in downtown Seoul, um, Myeongdong, um, and they ripped it up um, and restored the river. And it's now one of the most, and it's now a very long linear park. It's one of the most popular attractions uh, in Seoul. Um, and in addition, they constructed two parallel metro lines, um, which helped relieve a lot of the uh, um, demand. So one final thing I'll show is that weirdly, or it's not just other countries that, you know, we have a good example here for once. Um, this is Rochester, which was completely surrounded by this highway here. Um, and they have actually taken out the highway, um, taken out the loop and filled it in and built affordable housing. So what's kind of cool is you can do, you can see this on Google because they just did this. You can see what it was like, whoops. You can see the freeway there and then they didn't cap over it. They demolished it, they filled it in. Um, it's not a half measure like Boston did where you bury your highway. They got rid of it and they built some affordable housing. There could have been more, um, but there was at least some. So this is a great project. Um, nearby Syracuse is um, also doing uh, a similar thing. Um, 
this freeway, I think it's 61, um, 81, cut through the 15th Ward, which is now mostly parking lots, but it was the historic heart of the Black community in Syracuse. It was um, started as a free, freedman's town um, of people escaping from the South. Um, and Syracuse University wanted the land, um, and they got it. And the freeway divided the neighborhood. Uh, but now they're taking this out and reconnecting the grid, um, which is a great project. So there's some, it's not all doom and gloom, there's some optimism. Um, but that is my presentation. I can show you the website really quickly. And then um, I'll take any questions if there are. But so yeah, so this is the website. So, so far I've done Atlanta, Boston, Buffalo, the Bronx, Chicago, DC, Minneapolis. I'm counting New York as five different borough, as five different cities. It's too big to do otherwise. And I probably should have done that with the different sides of Chicago, but whatever. So Atlanta, these um, DC, Minneapolis, Oakland, Houston, Providence, Syracuse, Philadelphia so far. Um, and then I have some older ones that I haven't uploaded yet. Um, so you can check all this stuff out here. Um, I have more of those uh, sort of animation, those before and after animations. Um, here's Oakland. Uh, this is a pretty bad one. Um, just cut right through the sort of residential heart of Oakland. Um, and then the more times. And then I'll just show you this for um, if you haven't seen it. Um, I was lucky enough to work with the editors of the New York Times. They they helped me put together these really awesome graphics um, that show what's going to happen. There's the Clayton, the Clayton Homes. Um, this shows that uh, the people being displaced are primarily people of color, as usual. Um, and this is pretty fun to work on as well. This is uh, that animation, but uh, done with scrolling. They call the New York Times calls this scrolly telling. Restrictive covenant. So yeah, check it out. Um, there's this chart. You can actually search um, your city. Uh, oh, I guess sorry. Miami. Oklahoma, interest. Oh, okay. Miami's not old enough, but most of the cities are on there. Portland, Maine, but it's pretty cool. Um, there's more scrolly telling. This was an. This is an example of uh, a slum clearance in Chicago. This was a neighborhood in Bronzeville called Aldean Square that they demolished, replaced with um, public many far fewer units of public housing. That were very poorly designed, and then they all they ultimately displaced these people as well, um, which is not great either. Um, so, check it out uh, if you're interested. Um, the website uh, segregationbydesign.com um, and Instagram. Uh, you can check it out uh, segregate at segregation by design. Um, so cool. Yeah, let me know if you have any questions. I'll stop sharing. Thank you, Adam. Um, does anyone have any questions? No? What's, I'll, I'll ask a question before we welcome Zareth, our last presenter. Um, what's the next city and how do you choose which city to research next? The next city is going to be Miami. Um, and that's because I live there for the time being um, and I'm moving shortly. So I want to cover it before I leave. Do you um, want to divulge why you're moving? Oh yeah, I'm starting a PhD at um, TU Delft um, in the Netherlands. Um, although I haven't talked with work about that yet, so I need to figure that out. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, so, so I wanna cover Miami um, and get in touch. Um, cause, Cause living down here, I've, I've had the opportunity to make a lot of connections. But other than that, um, typically it has to do with um, so the list, the full list is on the site. Um, it's 180 cities that got money from those two bills that I mentioned, the 56 Freeway Act and then the, the um, Slum, the uh, Urban Renewal Act. Um, and it, it's give or take, because again, I'm counting New York as five cities. Um, and within those I cover, I'm trying to go for like the low hanging fruit first. Um, so that's uh, the ones that the Congress, so the, there's this organization called the Congress for the New Urg Urbanism, Andres Duani. Um, they put out this list of um, freeways without futures, um, which are the you know most obvious candidates for teardowns. So Rochester was one of them, but it's making progress. Um, but then the other ones are like Treme or, um, uh, 
the, Clair the Claiborne Expressway in Treme and New Orleans. Um, the uh, Louisville I'm doing soon. Um, yeah, so if there's, that's how I decided some of it. Uh, and then in addition, um, because I do have um, quite a few um, followers, uh, sometimes I just put it up to a vote. Um, and that's how I did, that's how I chose Philly. Um, and yeah, I'm probably gonna do, so Miami is next. I'm hoping to do Detroit soon as well as Tulsa. Um, but again, I mean, I, I'm planning on doing them all, so. Um, right, okay. Thank you so much. And I'm sure people will be following you after this. Um, I already do. So okay. congratulations again on your getting accepted and um, looking forward to your future research. We're going to take a minute just to switch out Zareth. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Adam. Hi, everyone. Uh, last presentation of the evening. Hopefully, we'll have a drink soon, 15 minutes-ish. Um, thank you for sticking around. Um, on a day like today, it really makes you feel that, especially since we've all been like Zoom saturated, this is one of my first events after a whole pandemic of Zoom events. The, the, the community here in everyone's work um, has been so special for me and in putting faces to the names of the people that were participated in this program has been wonderful. Um, I am a, an alumni from the UD program, class of 2017. I'm also the founder and executive director of Territorial Empathy, a nonprofit design collective based in Brooklyn. But before I tell you about Segregation is Killing Us, the project that I'm here to talk about today and how and why I founded Territorial Empathy, I think a lot of the reasons have been talked about already today, but I'll talk about some of my post-professional work. Luis and some of the guys and I were having a conversation about outside about how your first postgraduate school experience is so important. And mine was working on the District 15 diversity plan. Uh, for those of you who maybe listen to the New York Times and their podcast, it was the subject of the podcast, Nice White Parents, and I was one of the lead designers on it. Um, I don't know if anyone would venture to guess, um, and if anyone knows in the audience, what city in the United States has the most segregated public school districts? Um, I don't know if anyone knows. Yes, it, it is New York. Um, and it's something that uh, we hide behind because we have this beautiful and rich diversity, but we have the most segregated public school districts in this country. So the District 15 diversity plan was the first plan, um, community-led plan, then was um, integrating one of the districts of the 33 districts that we have in New York City public schools. Um, and the, this program had a little bit of a hard launch because of the designers that working on it didn't reflect the community that they were going to serve. Um, and it wasn't until I started working at that firm where I worked um, that I started realizing that people that were working on diversity plans that were at the cutting edge or so I thought of this type of integration work. Um, and I, I was just so excited to work on it that I started realizing in practice, like we talked about, that a lot of things don't, aren't as they seem. And I instantly became the person that was doing the analytics, all of these different things, but it was a predominantly um, Hispanic population and they couldn't get sign on because there wasn't anyone that had really connected to a community. At the time, the word diversity, especially in Latino communities, um, could really mean anything. It could mean um, LGBTQ issues. And so people were really nervous to come to community meetings. It was after the Trump administration to, to even engage. And so the work hadn't been done to connect with the community. So here I was fresh out of grad school, um, doing all of this analytics work, doing some architectural work as well as my job on the firm. And then um, they're like, well, you're the brown girl you know, go to the community and figure it out as I'm sure a lot of the people of color here can relate to, um, which is really problematic because I'd realized that even though there was well intended, it was well intended work, it was really problematic because the work to create the trust that many of the projects here have done was non-existent. So we talked about, you know, going to community meetings, doing all these different things, but there are so many barriers of entry and specifically Adam's work and so much of the work that's been talked about here tonight has, um, has 
connections to this past of intentional segregation and systemic racism that has been done very deliberately to hoard privilege from some at the expense of others. And who are the others? I think Adam um, answers those questions quite well in a lot of the work here. Um, and through many initiatives like redlining, so it felt like a lot of performative allyship. It didn't feel genuine. And I felt like I had to stand for this farm in this place and essentially lie to my community and my people because no one was doing the work. And then it fell on me to do that work to connect. And then I started thinking, if this is true, there has to be a better way. It, it, it just had to be because as some folks talked about today, Mustafa, only 2% of licensed architects are people of color or black people, Latino, Latinx identifying people, and it's 1% for women. And then when you have um, these, um, you know, capitalism, everyone has to make a profit when you're in a firm scenario and you're dependent on a bottom line, then there's different decisions that you take as I experienced throughout this process. And so I thought, well, I was very, in very uh, taken by the work of Audre Lorde and about dismantling, you can't dismantle the, the master's house with the master's tools and really thinking about how do I do my own thing that really recognizes the humanity and the people that I work with. And um, that brought me to uh, uh, the creation of Territorial Empathy in 2018. Um, it's a nonprofit design collective and I'll read a little bit of a mission statement. So because of what I talked about of segregation being so intentional, we think that that same level of care has to come with the undoing of that harm. So here it goes. Centering the historically oppressed through empathetic community-based design is necessary for overcoming systemic inequities. At Territorial Empathy, we work with people and places often overlooked to co-create just and resilient places. Our team of urbanists, architects, and researchers commit to, um, are committed to engaging in culturally sensitive, anti-racist, and anti-biased practices. So anyone that comes on board to work with us, me and interns or anyone at all, people donate their time. Um, what we do is we have serious conversations about the biases and racism that we all experience, the microaggressions that we experience, the privilege that we experience, and we make that a forefront. So we do, we take anti-racism and anti-bias training before we work with any communities to really question our privilege, to question all these different assumptions that we may or may not have before engaging in the work. And so, as I mentioned, through working in that space with the desegregation of schools and finding that the work was being was really performative, but also having some understanding from that after Territorial Empathy was created. Um, one of the first main projects that we worked on, which is what I'm talking to you about today, is segregation is killing us. So from my understanding and my work with the Department of Education, um, the New York City um, DOE has a million point one students and 70% 70 per, 70 of those students um, are low income students. And so that means that um, essentially what's happening now as gentrification happens and the reason that our schools are so segregated is because of the admissions metrics that we allow to uh, let people into middle schools and high schools. So some of you may not know because this is a very diverse group, but in New York City, students have to apply to go to certain middle schools and high schools, public, public schools. And so this system of screening, which is what is called, and I'll show you a little video about it that was co-produced with some of the student activists that we work with from this phenomenal organization called Intergrade NYC that I encourage you to look at. Um, Um, what's happening to this link? Oh, there we go. So this, this video will quickly talk about how we got to be so segregated in our public schools. We helped co-produce it um, and it's a part of segregation is killing us. But before I tell you a story of segregation is killing us, because I think many of you aren't parents yet and haven't had to deal with the public school system. This is a little video that will enlighten kind of what this process is like. These are the students of New York City Public Schools. There are 1.1 oh. 
They are racially diverse, economically diverse. Hi. Hola. Ning. Hao. Bonjour. Namaskar. They speak hundreds of different languages, come from different countries, and lead different lives. Every year, eighth graders go through the high school admissions process to discover which school they will attend in the fall. Like this school here. It looks like it has a lot of opportunities. A swimming pool, a baseball field, advanced classes. There's so much. Wouldn't you think a lot of kids would want to go there? Well, yes, a lot of students do want to attend, but decisions are based on screens. They can't just waltz in there. This school screen is that it accepts students who can afford a tutor, have sports teams in their middle and elementary school, and live in the wealthier part of the city. With all that, I don't think this school is for you. Back on the admissions bus, everyone. Hopefully the next school will be a bit more attainable for you. Here's the next school coming up ahead. And look, no screens. There may not be a field, pool, or that many advanced classes, but in this one, the teachers are amazing and the cafeteria has windows. Those seats are going to fill up quickly. Quickly, everyone, back on the admissions bus. We still have some great students looking to learn. Where will they go? This is our last school. Driver, is this a school? It is? Okay. Let's take a look at all the students we enrolled along our journey. These screens select, sort, and separate us. And not just in high school. There are middle school screens that select, sort, and separate 10-year-olds and make New York City one of the most segregated school systems in our country. These screens make it easier for students with privilege to access more resources. The students who are screened out are often low-income students and students of color, the same students who are feeling the most impact from COVID-19 right now. But students from these schools across the city have been joining together to form and mobilize a movement for real integration and real youth power. Where integration isn't about the movement of bodies, but the movement of minds. We are those students. In 2020, 66 years after Brown v. Board of Ed, our schools are still segregated. But we can change that. Join us in calling for an end to discriminatory screens. Our future is integrated. So these phenomenal students are essentially the clients where segregation is killing us. Um, segregation is killing us was born from what was happening during the pandemic. So essentially very early on, there was no data as to how communities of color were being impacted because these mapping tools um, are always very um, dependent on privilege in some ways. There's, there's not, okay, great. Um, and so what we started doing was working with um, different folks and the students to, to map what was happening in the pandemic and to see which communities were more affected. And as I've been working in New York City systemic issues for the last seven years, I've found that the map tends to look the same. The same areas are disproportionately affected and connecting to Adam's work, I had an inkling that would, it was related to redlining. But what the data found in our work, which was kind of guerrilla mapping and guerrilla activism, connecting to a drives from um, the health department to map this information before anyone was mapping it, um, was how disproportionately the impact of the pandemic was on communities of color. If you're a person of color in New York City, you're two times more likely to catch COVID and three times more likely to die. And we uh, went on a fact-finding mission to figure out why that was the case. Um, and I think one of the most important animations, and I, and again, I encourage you to look at the work on our website. Um, when you look at the cases by race, you start to see all these different patterns. Predominantly white communities weren't as, as affected, and that comes from generational wealth and comes from access to different issues. And we um, started un essentially going off of clues of what the students were telling us. And eventually segregation is killing us leads to a policy proposal. I don't know if we'll have time to get into it today, but um, I'll just 
show you one of the most, um, I think to me during this work, um, one of the most telling animations. And so during the pandemic, everyone was talking about flattening the curve, um, but no one had studied the curve by median income. And so I'll show you, all, also all of the work that, is hap that happens here is narrated and animated and designed by students from Intergrade NYC. They're all young people um, from middle school to college years who came to us with these issues. And so the way that we talk about territorial empathy is that we're really doulas that have a skill set that allow people to manifest the work and the curiosities that they have. Um, so I'll show you a little bit of this animation, which I think is very telling. And it's narrated by Sakira Mustafa, a phenomenal um, st young student at the time, and now she's a freshman at Columbia, um, which is really great. Contrary to popular belief, COVID-19 does not impact every New Yorker the same. It is in no way an equalizer. There is troubling inequity when it comes to the virus passing through New York City and who it affects. The phase one COVID-19 data showcases that communities of color and lower income communities have been hit the hardest by this pandemic. The data clearly shows that wealthier, less diverse neighborhoods of our city were less impacted by the pandemic, whilst low-income communities of color were devastated, leaving hundreds dead and thousands infected. We can clearly see these discrepancies. They are due to income, economic standing, the ability to quarantine and preserve social distancing. Privilege and wealth play an important part in the ability to isolate and therefore be less exposed to infection. Communities of color and lower income communities have been hit the hardest by this pandemic, whilst wealthier, less diverse neighborhoods of our city were less impacted. The inequity is clear. Essentially, the curve applies to everyone else except high income New Yorkers, which then led us down this other road of inquiry, um, which is really about all right, so what's happening with these wealthy New Yorkers? And um, that led us to a collaboration with this company called Terralytics, uh, who is, a, is telecom adjacent. Um, and they do some phenomenal, well, they do essentially, I mean, everyone knows that our data from our phones is sold to marketers and you know when you say something and like two minutes later you're getting an ad for it but instead of using this data for evil um terralytics sometimes have has these partnership programs and we essentially went to them and we're like look could you donate this data to us so we could see what happened and why these people weren't getting infected in the same ways um and that started a series of conversations that led to this animation uh, essentially that is asking where did the wealthier and white New Yorkers go and why weren't they affected as much? So this is a timeline. And as you can see, it's from the, from the time that the, we started recording data and, and this is all the first phase of the pandemic. So it was the first year is lockdown. This is a time-lapse showing where wealthier New Yorkers went during phase one of quarantine. The privilege of immobility during the peak of this pandemic left neighborhoods empty and facilitated the spread of COVID across this country. The empty neighborhoods house 68% white residents. Fifty-five percent of the neighborhoods left empty have a median income over $100,000 per year. 29% of these neighborhoods have a median income over $200,000 per year. The median rent of the apartments left empty is $2,223 per month. So basically through that work, we found out that there was um, some unsavory decisions being made about social distancing and some were a privilege. And so then we started looking into our city's essential workforce because we heard the story of this woman who was a cleaner, who was part of our community, and she's an undocumented person, 
then went to clean at home while the owners were away. And then the neighbors asked her, uh, Clara, what are you doing here? And she was like, well, I'm just doing the regular cleaning. And they say, um, this family all has COVID and they're in their second home in Connecticut. Um, and so they literally sent her in to clean up after them so that everything could be nice and tidy by the time they came back, not giving any window um, for, for anything. They left and the next day she was in there. And so this is when we talk about the privilege of being able to social distance, trying to expose essentially why we have these disparate metrics. So 62% of the city's essential workforce is Black and Latino. And so that's something that we forget about in the ability to social distance, who is available to get the PPP loans, who is available to get the $1,000, you know, different credits that some folks got at different points. And what is really important is that not only is 77% of our essential workforce people of color, but a lot of them are foreign born and 19% are citizens. And we try to estimate um, to the best of our abilities because this work has been used time and time again to support different um, undocumented um, organizations, but it comes also with a, with a danger that we don't wanna be able to pinpoint people too much because that information can be used to harm people. And so with that, I will quickly show you a video of the admissions proposal that we came up with because during the pandemic and because of our communities don't really have the backing to think about spatial information to change policy. Uh, we knew that the DRE would fall asleep at the wheel and we said, all right, there's already screens that are used like attendance, test scores, all these different other metrics like portfolios to get into a middle school and a high school. And what the research shows is that those metrics are a reflection of privilege because if you have three jobs and you have many kids, um, the ability for them to get to school on time changes completely radically differently than if you have a nanny or you're a two-person household. So all of these metrics that are used to allow kids into the different middle schools and high schools reflect privilege. And what we said is, at least during the pandemic, let's give these families a break because they've been going through so much and they are the backbone that keeps the lights of the city on. It's an isolated issue. Let's understand the system. Rather than looking at COVID as an isolated issue, let's understand the systemic inequalities that made COVID worse for some communities. Our proposal addresses identified variables that are based on hardships exacerbated by the pandemic. COVID score, household size, linguistic isolation, child poverty, lack of medical insurance, and computer access are all hardships that have been exacerbated by the pandemic. Each of these variables was assigned a weight that reflects its urgency and magnitude. delivering us a composite map that shows which communities lack the resources to bounce back from COVID. The resulting map has a corresponding priority score that uses the student's home address to determine the admissions priority based on community impact. Additionally, we consider individual student circumstances that may also increase the need for priority consideration in the admissions process. This way, both community impact and individual burdens are taken into consideration to allocate each student on a priority admission scale from one to three that best reflects its particular needs. In response to the deep impacts of COVID-19 on our communities, the admissions impact score heavily weighs COVID-19 data. Because the pandemic is exposing and exacerbating long existing inequities, we propose that over time, the weight of the COVID-19 specific criteria changes as the other criteria may increase, maintaining a system-wide priority for those who have been historically marginalized. We aim to support resilience for all through equitable policies. So essentially what we did is that, as the video shows, we created a metric- Rather than looking at COVID as an isolated issue- We created a metric that, um, Essentially, instead of looking at test scores, attendance, all these different things that during the pandemic became so impossible to track, 
is we had all of these community meetings with students and they designed their new educational policy. They said, we don't have access to internet. We can't socially distance because there's 10 people living in a one bedroom apartment in Queens. We, our parents are not native English speakers. And so we took all of the burdens that the students had and then we had workshops with them and they assigned weights to different, um, to the different um, categories. And we created this core that essentially operates by census tract um, that allows them for that community score to be more indicative of what they're going through to that be used in the admissions process instead of these screens that are kind of arbitrary. And so right now the policy is um, in the process of being um, studied. Uh, we uh, essentially the way that admissions works is I don't know if anyone's familiar with medical school, the stable match process that links uh, the residents to the hospitals. It's a similar process that we use here. So the simulation of that is being done right now by MIT and hopefully we'll be able to implement this policy in three pilot schools the next academic year. But this would be the first of its kind to look at community impacts and the burdens of systemic issues like redlining, like community impacts and be used in an admissions policy instead of these metrics that essentially reflect the ability of a family to hire a tutor or do these different things. Um, so I welcome everyone to take a look at it. Um, segregation is killing us. Um, right now we're in a big fight because this research was used to remove middle school screens, which were halted during the pandemic and the new administration would like to bring them back. So this work keeps coming up and I've been, I just wanna thank Leslie and the incubator staff and Esther and everyone that made this happen because a lot of the funding from the GSAP incubator grant went to the outreach and to the mobilization of community organizing to use this research to fight for equity in our public schools. Um, thank you. Um, Zareth, I, you know, I, I thank you so much. I love this tangible like solution that you are able to propose and put forth to the DOE. Um, I will be rooting for you as a parent of, uh, children in the DOE, but, um, I, I was able to join the Zoom launch of the website where you presented alongside Integrate NYC. And I can testify to the amazingness of these children, the children, young, young people that you worked with. I mean, even over Zoom, their energy and compassion was palpable. It was, it was amazing. And just so happy that GZAP can be a part of supporting this work and I encourage people to go on territorial empathy because Zareth has a way of working with um, each community that she partners with in a very unique way, unique to, to, to that project. Um, so before we open the reception, I'd love to open the floor to anyone with a question for Zareth. Just in <laughs> awe of your work. Um, and I, okay, so, I, you know, Zareth will be in the reception. So please say hi to her, as well as Cheryl and Nelson, Luis, Fabrizio, Catherine, and did I miss anyone else who presented in person? Um, but also the next incubator, before we wrap up, as we're wrapping up, I just wanna say that the next cohort will be announced um, hopefully in a matter of weeks. So you'll be hearing from us about that and really excited to, to work with the next cohort as much as um, I've enjoyed working with this one. So please say hi to everybody um, and, and enjoy the reception. Thank you.